order. We now come to the motion on section 13 of the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. I inform the House that I have provisionally selected amendments D, that is to say the amendment in the name of the Leader of the Opposition, A in the name of the Right Honourable Gentleman, the Member for West Dorset, and F, F for Freddie, in the name of Dame Margaret Beckett. I remind the House that under the terms of the business motion just agreed to, the debate may continue until 10 p.m., at which time the questions will be put on any amendments which may then be moved. To move the main motion, I call the Minister for the Cabinet Office and the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, Mr David Liddington. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, sir, I beg to move the motion on the order paper, standing in the name of my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, this debate follows as a result of the requirements of the EU Withdrawal Act and is a consequence of the decision taken by this House on the 12th of March. Since that date, the House has spoken on two further occasions. First, on the 13th of March, the House expressed its opposition to leaving the European Union without a deal. And on the 14th of March, the House agreed that the Government should seek an extension to Article 50. And I might, a second, I might add, Mr Speaker, uh, that in respect of both those votes in this House, neither was legally binding on the Government, but in each case the Government has honoured the wishes of the House in response to the resolution. I hope that might provide at least a modicum of reassurance that in this Government we do not, we have not and we do not intend to be dismissive in the least of how this House decides or votes. Give way to the Honourable Gentleman. I'm very grateful to the, I'm very grateful to the Prime Minister-elect for giving way. Um, he, rightly just said, he rightly just said on the, that on the 13th of March this House agreed to not leave in the European de Union without a deal. And in the Prime Minister's statement that she's just given this House, she said, unless this House agrees to it, no deal will not happen. Could you explain to this House what she meant by that statement? Well, sir. Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, um, the, what the Prime Minister said I, I, I thought was um, quite clear that the, the, government, the Government believes in the case that we frequently brought to this House for the deal that we believe is in the interests of the United Kingdom that is something that both those who supported leave and those who, report, who voted remain should be able to rally behind and move forward. Um, we know that uh, the legal default position must remain no deal because from now on any decision about this is contingent not only upon the view that this House might take or the Government might take, but on decisions by the European Council as to whether or not they wish to, ex wish to extend. Well, I, if um, other colleagues will forgive me, I do want to reply to one intervention before I, I move on to others. Um, the, and it was by no means a given that an extension would have been granted at last week's European Council. Um, if, if I give way to the I'll remember first and then to the Chair of the Committee. Thank, I thank the, uh, um, the Minister of the Cabinet Office for, for giving way. My honourable friend makes a very important point. And as we embark upon another very important debate today and a number of serious important debates over the next few days, um, can I just raise with him the concern that I have um, about the Prime Minister's speech um, last Wednesday night? Um, she has apologised. She has made a, 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 well, maybe not a clear, as, a clear apology as we would have liked, but she has made um, some recognition that perhaps the words were not appropriate. But I was particularly concerned to see. Um, that the clips from her speech were being pumped out across Facebook with targeted advertising, paid for by taxpayers' money, paid for by the Cabinet Office, um, into different MPs' inboxes. Would you agree with me that at this time it is not appropriate to be raising the heat um, in this debate when what we need is a, a, an atmosphere of compromise, of concern um, and, of, and of respect for all the different views across this House, bringing people together, not dividing them further? I, I, I don't think, Mr Speaker, there's anybody in the House that would disagree with the 
honourable gentleman's comments at the end of his intervention. Certainly not my right honourable friend, the, the Prime Minister. And I think we are all of us deeply aware um, and looking up at the memorial shield to our former colleague Joe Cox, I am very sharply reminded of the fact that many members of this House have been subjected to the most appalling threats, intimidation and online trolling. And I think every one of us in our individual or in our representative capacities has a responsibility to ensure that no encouragement or succour is given to those wicked people who seek to act and intimidate in that way. Give way to right honourable gentleman. I'm very, great, I'm very grateful to the Chancellor of the Duchess of Lancaster for giving way. Can I return to the point of the first intervention which he took? And that is the Prime Minister's categorical statement, which I have to say I welcome today. Unless this House agrees to it, no deal will not happen. That could not be clearer. Given what he has rightly said about the need for the European Union then to take decisions that facilitate this, isn't the inevitable consequence of what the Prime Minister has told the House today, unless she gets her deal through, she will have to apply for an extension prior to the 12th of April? That depends, of course, upon um, what this House decides to do this week. Um, that is the logic, certainly, of, uh, of, the, of the, uh, the Honourable Gentleman's argument of my right Honourable Friend's remarks. If, if we start from the premise that the House uh, were not to uh, approve the withdrawal agreement this week, I hope it is the Government's intention to persuade the House uh, to approve the withdrawal agreement during this week, in which case the uh, deadline moves forward automatically to the 22nd of, of May. But I, I do repeat the, the, the comment I made earlier in response to the Honourable Member for, for Edinburgh South, that um, the, the United Kingdom can request, but it is not ever a certainty that the European Council will agree. I give way to Honourable Member for, for North Perth. Very great, grateful to the putative Prime Minister, can I just say to you, I mean, he couldn't possibly do a worse job than what we've seen in the course of the past few years. But can I ask him if he's paid attention to the petition that's now been signed by 5.5 million people right across the UK, including over 10 per cent of the right honourable gentleman's constituency? Would he now agree and would he concur that revoke just ending this madness once and for all remains a real life possibility for this country now? Yeah, yeah. No, no, I, no, I don't agree with him. And, and um, you know, since in my, in my constituency the, the votes were pretty finely balanced in, in 2016 between the, the two sides in the referendum, you know, it, it wouldn't surprise me that 10% uh, of my constituents felt strongly in favour of, uh, of revocation in, in the way that he suggests. I think that, but you know, obviously, one takes seriously the. Uh, both the scale but also the strength of the opinion that was being expressed in the demonstration at the weekend and in the number of signatories that have been attracted to, to sign the petition. But that does not mean that one can simply ignore or set aside the idea that 17.4 million people yeah, yeah. did vote to leave the European well, Union yeah, yeah. in 2016. Now, um, yes, I'll give way to my honourable friend. Uh, and, and I, and I will try to make some progress. I am pleased he has reiterated that 17.4 million people took the trouble, and many of those people had never voted ever before to engage in, in the, the referendum. Can I ask him, given that when the House voted um, on the recent times about whether we should have no deal or the withdrawal agreement for the second vote, now the Prime Minister seems to have taken no deal off the table. So for some of us, there will be different options to think about. I think it is vital that the withdrawal agreement comes back before the House. Because if no deal is off the table, there may well be much worse deals that are put forward by a Remainer House that those of us that do not wish to see them happen will feel we've got a very, very bad situation. I cert uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I certainly hope that uh, we have the opportunity to vote again on the withdrawal agreement during the course of this week. I'll give way to the uh, Honourable Lady, the Honourable Friend. I thank the Minister for giving way, and he said uh, very clearly that 
the government has, has responded to two of the motions that were passed recently and, and honoured them uh, in, in the last couple of weeks. But what about that huge majority that there was for the withdrawal agreement and leaving on March the 29th still legally in our, in our statute books? Now, because of some agreement stitched up between the Prime Minister and the European Union, we're not even having the chance to decide that or look at that. Now, surely that is constitutionally not correct, apart from being legally not correct. I'm, I will, I'll come on to say a bit more about the statutory instrument in a, in a few minutes, if the Honourable Lady will bear with me. Give way to my Honourable Friend. I, I, thank, I thank my Honourable Friend for giving way. I, I support the Prime Minister's deal. I think it's a good deal. Um, I welcome the news that we give you voting on again. But will my Honourable Friend look closely at the very important proposals put forward by my, my Honourable Friend for Gainsborough to amend and change the unilateral declaration as a way of providing more certainty and clarity and reassurance to those who are not yet ready to vote for that deal? I, I know that um, you know, the, I, I can reassure my, my honourable friend that the, the government certainly has taken very seriously the comments by our right honourable friend, the, the member for Gainsborough, and you know, we continue to have a dialogue with him and others who are to try to find the best way forward. Give way to my right honourable learned friend, then the honourable member for Cardiff West, and then I am going to make some, 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 some progress. On. Uh, on, on the question of the government's commitment to <laughs> avoid or no deal in line with the votes, the, my right honourable friend has acceded that the government does accept last week's votes, which I think is in line with Constitution Convention, that the government does not proceed with policies that are rejected by this House of Commons. But he's, he's agreed that. And then he said that therefore it means either we pass a withdrawal agreement, which I vote for, but if that doesn't, uh, the only remedy, presumably, is to go and ask for an extension, which he rightly says we can't guarantee the Europeans would accept. But in line with the wishes of this House and what is now the policy of the government, if we're driven by the more hardline people in this House to that circumstance, then obviously the government must revoke with the hope that we start the whole process again once this House and everybody else has come back to their senses and has some consensus about how we do wish to proceed on the question of our future relations with the rest of the world. Um, I, uh, with all respect, I, I disagree with my right honourable learned friend on that point because I think that he, um, I think he underestimates the quite how severe the damage would be to already fragile public confidence in our democratic processes if this House simply voted to revoke uh, the uh, implementation of a decision which the majority of members in this House said in 2016 we would be giving to the electorate as a whole and said that we would abide by their decision. Give way to the honourable gentleman, then, then the honourable member for Stoke, and then, then if the honourable member for Old will forgive, forgive me, I will I'll, I'll make some progress and I will have to give way to my right honourable member friend later. Very grateful. He's been, he's been extremely generous, and, I, and I, I can't see how any deal can proceed without there being some sort of uh, public vote at the end of the process in the circumstances we're in. But on the question of today's business, uh, the Prime Minister said earlier that uh, the government was prepared to bring forward or to give time itself, or seek time, I think she said, seek to provide time to discuss indicative options. Could you clarify for the House exactly what she meant by that? When uh, is the government prepared to do it? For how long? And can you confirm that it would be in the hands of the House exactly what those options were that we debate? Mr Speaker, I would gladly do so. Um, I, I would ask colleagues to, uh, if, if, if they will, bear with me to complete page one of my speech and move to <laughs> subsequent sections, then, then I might be able to throw a bit more light on some, the answer to some of the questions that are being posed to me. Give way to the for Stoke, and then I, I'm going to make some progress. I, I thank the uh, Minister for giving way. If I may, my assessment of where we are is that there actually does exist a majority for the withdrawal agreement, the technical aspect of our leaving the European Union, but the differences and the difficulty is on the political declaration and where that may take us, where we may end up in that situation, and what support and clarity this House will have over that process. So is the, is the Minister able to give some assurances, some, some sense that this House will have a clear role in the next stage of negotiations so that we can avoid this merry-go-round 
at the next stage? Um, uh, yes, indeed, it's something to which um, the government has been giving a lot of thought and, and has certainly featured in some of the conversations that ministers have been having with members across the House, not just in the last few days, but, but in the last several weeks. Um, there are various models that uh, could be adopted, um, you know, and uh, you know, particularly there would be the question of you know, the role of select committees, both the uh, Brexit Select Committee and the relevant departmental uh, select committees in different aspects of that uh, very wide-ranging negotiation. And, and frankly, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I mean, one lesson I've drawn from the experience of the last couple of years here is that the House is simply going to insist on having a say and will find ways uh, in which to express its view, um, uh, including some, there are some, some, some novel initiatives. Um, that, uh, so I think that the reality is the House is going to have a say, the House is going to have influence uh, as those negotiations uh, proceed and I would hope that the, uh, the agreement that I, I believe the government will eventually uh, succeed in striking is one that will then command very widespread public support. Now, Mr Speaker, I, I, it's on this part, I, all right, I, I will I'll break my rule, give way to our and friend, and then I, I hope the House will allow me to move on. So I, I, I'm, very, I'm very grateful to my right honourable friend for his characteristic courtesy. May I just take him back to his answer to my right honourable learned friend, the member for Rushcliffe, who raised the issue of revocation? Because I rather share the view of my right honourable friend that revocation would indeed be a drastic act, but the fact that so many people are signing up to advocate it is probably a reflection, I suggest, of a growing level of exasperation. Is it not the case that the better course of action, rather than revoking unilaterally, is to go back and ask the public whether they want the Prime Minister's deal with the alternative of Remain, which does show respect for the 2016 referendum result. My anxiety is this. The Government boxed itself in with red lines in its negotiations with the European Union. Now what it's doing is boxing itself in with red lines in relation to the options available to this House to resolve the current difficulty and crisis. And I also worry, I have to say to my right honourable friend, that if the uh, stories about the Cabinet minutes are correct, some of the reasons appear to be very narrow and partisan at a time when a national crisis should be requiring us to look more widely. Those of us who have tried to do that get vilified, but I am quite prepared to put up with that because I think that is where the national interest lies. Uh, Mr Speaker, one, one thing I can say with, with great confidence is, is that my right honourable friend, the, the Prime Minister, uh, above all, is somebody who, in all my observation of her approach to these negotiations and the subsequent parliamentary proceedings, has been motivated entirely by what is right for the national interest. And judging the national interest certainly involves looking at the content uh, and terms of our departure, but the national interest does also mean taking account of the fact of the referendum result in 2016 and the political and democratic reality which that represents. Now, Mr. No, I, I, Mr. Speaker, I, I'm going to make some, some progress. Last week, the European Council approved during its meeting the legally binding assurances in relation to the Northern Ireland backstop, which the Prime Minister had negotiated with President Juncker a fortnight ago. <laughs> and as my right honourable friend has set out, this should give additional assurance to members that in the unlikely event that the backstop were ever used, <coughs> it would only be temporary and that the United Kingdom and the European Union would begin work immediately to replace the backstop with alternative arrangements by the end of December 2020. The Council also agreed subject to a vote in this House to approve the withdrawal agreement this week, that the date of our departure from the EU would be extended to the 22nd of May in order to provide time for this House to agree and ratify 
a Brexit deal and pass the necessary legislation to make that possible. However, in the event that the House did not approve the withdrawal agreement this week, the European Council agreed that Article 50 should, in such a case, be extended only until the 12th of April. At that point, we would have two options. We could leave without a deal, or we would need to have agreed an alternative plan for a longer extension with the European Union, and they would have to have accepted that. And such a longer extension, it is very clear from what EU leaders and the EU institutions have said, would require elections to the European Parliament to be held in the United Kingdom. Mr Speaker, on the 14th of March, I told this House that in the event that honourable members had not approved a meaningful vote by the 20th of March and agreed a timetable for the EU withdrawal agreement bill, the Government would recognise that the House would require time to consider the potential ways forward. The Government stands by the commitment that I set out that day, that in such a scenario the Government, having consulted the usual channels at that time, would facilitate a process in the two weeks after the March European Council to allow the House to seek a majority on the way forward. And since then, my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, and I have acted on that commitment and have been engaged constructively with members from across the House in recent days. Between us, we have met leaders of all parties as well as other senior parliamentarians, and this process is ongoing. My right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, met the Leader of the Opposition earlier today. These, these discussions will continue. Well, my right honourable friend, you wait. I'm very grateful to the right honourable gentleman. In, in those discussions with the Leader of the Opposition, there are reports today that the Prime Minister put forward a proposal to decouple the withdrawal agreement from the political declaration as a proposal to take forward and seek compromise. Is that correct? And what was the response of the Labour front bench? It is the, it is the, the European Council conclusions specify that it is approval of the withdrawal agreement that uh, count in terms of whether there is an extension to uh, the 22nd of May. Um, and, of course, the, the requirements in those terms in the European Council conclusions are different in scope from what is required under the EU Withdrawal Act to constitute a meaningful vote under the terms of, of that Act. I give way to my... I am grateful to my right honourable friend, and you may know what I am going to ask, because I asked the Prime Minister, and she suggested I ask him. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I do this on the basis of someone who he knows uh, voted to support the agreement last time and will vote to do so again. But it is an important issue, and that says my honourable friend has just said uh, that the government will facilitate the discussion of alternative arrangements should the deal not, for whatever reason, succeed in the two weeks following the European Council. Well, we are already eating into the two weeks following the European Council, and my right honourable friend urges us to resist, for various reasons, which I can understand to some degree, the so-called Letwin amendments. Uh, but he has not yet come forward with a timetable as to when the government will bring forward its own means of facilitation and the terms. Can I ask him what else, the Prime Minister? When? Um, yes, Mr Speaker. Um, as I said a moment ago, these discussions with other parties and members across the House will continue, but I can confirm to the House today that the Government would seek to provide Government time in order for this process to proceed. If the amendment in the name of my right honourable friend, the Member for West Dorset, does not pass tonight, we would uh, set aside time to have a first day's debate later this week, and after that day's debate had been concluded, we would then consider and consult about what, if any, further time might be needed. Now, if, if, on, the, if, if, in second, if on the other hand my, my right honourable friend's amendment is carried, then the, the consequence of that, in terms of control, of the order paper means that those decisions 
would be very much a matter for my right hon. Friend and the, the House more generally, given the terms in which that amendment has been drafted. I'm going to give way to my, my, my hon. Friend, the hon. Gentleman for Oldham, and then the, my hon. Friend. I thank the hon. Gentleman for giving way. Can he confirm that there will be free votes on this side of the House when that, if that situation occurs? Well, I think it's premature to say anything at this stage about whipping because we, at the moment we don't know exactly what the content of any options might be, nor what amendments might conceivably be tabled to those, nor which of those amendments the Chair might be willing to accept. But the, I, will, I, will, I know that um, my right hon. Friend, the, the Chief Whip, will have heard uh, my hon. Friend's representations. Give way to the member for Oldham and, and then to... Uh, can I thank him for giving way? The reason why the Prime Minister's statement last Wednesday was so disappointing, and we'll hear it today actually, it's not about the 17 million any more than it is the 16 million. It's about everybody who lives in this country who has a stake in its future. And people are looking at what's happening in absolute frustration and despair that those people who they have elected to make decisions and make this work have not found a way through this. Now, we have an opportunity with the indicative votes that are coming to really make a breakthrough and find some common ground, but it would require the Prime Minister to, to depart from the red lines and learn to compromise. What yeah. advice would he offer to the Prime Minister in this circumstance? <laughs> uh, I'm afraid one, one thing I'm very clear about indeed is that I will offer, I'm very willing to, to offer, and do offer advice to my right honourable friend, but I talk about that advice to her in private and not in the House more generally. Give way to honourable friend. I would like to thank my right honourable friend for giving way. Many of my constituents are emailing me asking me to vote for Amendment A tonight. Can my right honourable friend confirm that even if that amendment does not go through, the government will make time for indicative votes? If we haven't passed the withdrawal agreement, the government will make time for indicative votes, and will those votes happen this week or next week? Uh, as I said, said uh, a moment ago, if, the, if Amendment A does not pass, then we will make available a first day this week for the, the process to, to which we have committed ourselves to proceed. It may be that other time is needed, but that would be a matter for consideration after the first day had been concluded. Um, I, I, will, I, will, I will give way to the Honourable Lady, then to the Right Honourable Lady, then I hope the House will give you. I am going to try and move on. The Honourable Gentleman is um, uh, very generous in, in giving way. Um, if the Amendment A is voted down and the Government does indeed come forward uh, with proposing its own slot, will the Government determine the options this House votes on, or will MPs? Um, the, I think that uh, the, the Honourable Lady um, was preempted my next paragraph, because what I was about to say is that we do not think that it is for the Government to tell the House what options it should and should not consider. That should be a matter for the House. Um, but it does, that in turn does not mean that the Government is going to be silent about the options that might be debated. We will certainly continue to be strong advocates for the deal we have negotiated, and we will continue to urge members from all sides to be realistic. Give way to the Right Honourable Lady. Well, again, the Right Honourable Gentleman is incredibly generous with his time. Can he help us, though, with this? Is it the government's plan that those votes will relate to the withdrawal agreement or will they only deal with the political declaration? Because, as he knows, there is a pr profound difference between the two. The former, the withdrawal agreement, will go into, if it passes, into treaty, into law and so on, international law, but the political declaration is non-binding. If I could, if the, the Honourable Lady, right on lady the, my, will bear with me, I want to come to that in a second, but I will give way to my right honourable learned friend one, one last time. But before he moves back to that point, uh, I'm very grateful. The, 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 I mean, the, my, my right honourable friend has said that the government is going to reject, or try to reject, the so called Letwin Amendment this evening, but then will make time available for roughly the same thing in government time. So, the whole, as far as I can see, the only objection to the amendment we have today is it's been tabled by a backbencher and not by the government. Wouldn't this all be resolved if he were confirmed that the government will make 
this Wednesday available for this purpose, because we don't have much time, and then it seems to me we'd all be in total agreement to be able to proceed to the uh, indicative votes. And, and, Mr Speaker, until we have had um, the division this evening, assuming there is one on my right hon. Friend's uh, amendment, we won't know whether Wednesday is available for the Government's disposal or whether that is something that will, will fall to, to other means of consideration. Um, Mr. S Mr. Speaker, I look, I'll give way to the Honourable Member for Ilfordshire, the Honourable my Honourable Friend Member for Falmouth and, uh, and, and Truro, and then I am going to make some progress. Um, I am genuinely grateful that he's, he's given way, but this is genuinely hopeless. You can't, he can't, Mr. Speaker, argue against a perfectly sensible and reasonable in the circumstances uh, amendment in the name of the Honourable Member, right Honourable Member for West Dorset, on the basis that the government is going to propose something similar, without at this stage saying on what day, for how long, on what conditions, on what range of motions. You know, that if, if he is saying that Parliament shouldn't be in control because the government ought to be in control, then surely it's reasonable to expect the government to actually be in control, to have some sense of what the process is, and to give some clarity now. Otherwise, we may as well troop through to vote for the Right Honourable Member's amendment. Mr. 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 Speaker, the, it, it, there is a matter of constitutional principle here. What the government is saying is that what the government is saying is that it is for the government, as is normal, to control the order paper, but in this case, we would devote that time to consideration of those measures that the House wanted to see debated and decided. I'll, I give way to my honourable friends. I pro promise, and then, I, I, well, I, I think I have an obligation to give way to my right honourable friend afterwards. I'm very, very grateful, uh, and my right honourable friend is being incredibly generous and gracious. Is it not the case? that it's common practice for, in a debate, for sometimes the government to actually welcome an amendment posed by members of the backbench or the opposition parties. And given, from what I have heard, the right honourable gentleman has said he is actually going to do on Wednesday exactly what Amendment A says, wouldn't the easiest thing to do just be accept Amendment A tonight? I think the, the, the difference between us, Mr. Uh, between myself and my honourable friend, Mr. Speaker, on this occasion is, is that I do take the view, and the government takes the view, that the amendment that is before us, Amendment A, would upset the balance between legislature and executive in a way that would set an unwelcome precedent. And it's for that reason that we uh, are not supporting this amendment. Now, I'm going to give way, as I said I would do, to my right honourable friend, the member for West Dorset. Yes, the honourable gentleman. Point of orders, William Cash. Uh, I'd be grateful for your guidance on this whole question of uh, standing order 14, given the fact that we operate a system of a parliamentary government, not government by parliament, and it's for a good reason, which is, in a nutshell, the fact that government takes precedence, understanding all of 14 in its business, because it is, in, it, is, it is the wish of the members of parliament by a majority of the government, which forms the government, and therefore the wishes of the electorate are at stake. I just ask you if you would be kind enough to uh, refer to that. Ref just answer my question, if you might, if, please, Mr. Speaker, because I regard this as a matter of fundamental constitutional importance. Down and listen. Well, and I very much look forward to listening to the speech that the honourable gentleman might make in the course of the debate. And he knows that he can always look to me and very much expect to catch my eye. So far as the standing order is concerned, the fact of its presence is well known to everybody. But the House is the owner of the standing orders, and if a proposition is put to the House for a change in those arrangements, including in a particular case the suspension of a standing order or more than one standing order, it is perfectly credible and reasonable that that should be put to the House. And I did, after all, announce my selection and provisional selection of amendments earlier. 
And I don't think, although I accept that he objects to this amendment, it came as any great surprise that the cross-party amendment in the name of the Right Honourable Gentleman for West Dorset was selected. As to whether it is acceptable to the House, that does remain to be seen. It's obviously not acceptable to the Honourable Gentleman, and we will hear further and better particulars of his objection in due course. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I give way to my right honourable friend. I, I'm really very grateful to my right honourable friend, and I, I promised him I wasn't intending to intervene in his speech, unlike almost everybody else sitting in the chamber today. Uh, but, but he does um, force me to do so because I wonder whether he could clarify a, a slightly different point. Um, given that his objection to our amendment is ostensibly simply the constitutional one, and given that that could be entirely resolved by the government accepting the amendment, or indeed could have been resolved uh, on Thursday or Friday when it was tabled by the government signing it and turning it into a government amendment, in that case a government minister would have been at the top of the list, um, uh, given all of that, could he simply tell us whether on the Wednesday, if our amendment fails, the government intends to operate exactly the same principles as are contained within that amendment, or whether the government has some other plan about how to construct the day. Minister. I, I can't give a, a commitment immediately for that, of that level of detail, but I will have further discussions, and it may be that my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State, will be able to respond to that point in greater detail when in his wind-up speech. Um, Mr. Mr. Speaker, um, look, with, with, Mr. Speaker, can I say this? I mean, I... I'm, 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 so, I'm always over-tempted to give way to interventions. I am deeply conscious that on the last two occasions I came to this dispatch box, I was hit, speaking for over an hour in total because of the number of interventions that uh, I permitted. So I am going to try to make some progress because I'm sure many right honourable and honourable members on all sides of the House do actually want to catch your eye and contribute themselves to the debate. Now, whatever options are put forward, and this starts to address the issue raised by the Right Honourable Lady Member for Broxtow. Whatever options are put forward, they will need to be negotiable with the European Union. Yes. And in particular, any deal, we any deal will require the withdrawal agreement that not only we, but the 27 other governments of the European Union member states have negotiated. The conclusions, the conclusions of the European Council last week could not have been clearer that they are not prepared to consider any reopening of the terms of the withdrawal agreement that for them, as well as for us, represented the outcome of a lengthy period of negotiation and compromise on both sides. And it is this is one of the reasons why my right honourable friend was clear earlier this afternoon that the government cannot simply pre-commit to accepting whatever might come out of this process. It is entirely possible that this House could vote for something that is neither realistic nor negotiable. For example, it could vote to seek further changes to the withdrawal agreement, which the EU has been clear is simply not going to be possible. Equally, the House could vote to maintain all the benefits of the single market without agreeing to the obligations, that, uh, such as alignment with state aid rules or free movement of people, while the EU has been clear that the four freedoms are indivisible. But, of course, we will engage constructively with members across the House on whatever the outcome of this process is. And we continue to believe, though, that the amendment in the name of my right honourable friend, the member for West Dorset, would be an unwelcome precedent to set, that it would overturn the balance between Parliament and Government. In the event that his amendment uh, were carried tonight, then obviously we would want to have a dialogue with him and his co-sponsors about uh, how he proposed to take those measures forward. Now, in addition, no, I'm not going to give way further, Mr. Speaker. Now, I want to say a few words um, to add to those of the Prime Minister about the statutory instrument uh, that has been published today uh, about the uh, extension of Article 50. 
because now that the United Kingdom and the European Union have agreed an extension to Article 50, and that, that has been embodied in a legal decision of the European Council, the date needs to be amended to reflect in our domestic law the new point at which the EU treaties will cease to apply in the United Kingdom. The Government has therefore laid today a draft statutory instrument under the EU Withdrawal Act that provides for both of the possible extensions, the 12th of March and the 22nd of May. This will be subject to the draft affirmative uh, procedure. I, I, did, I, I, did I misspeak, March? I think I, I meant April. Uh, this will be subject to the draft affirmative procedure so that it will be debated in each House and it must come into force by 11 pm on the 29th of March. And the purpose of this is to make sure that our own statute book reflects the extension of Article 50, which is legally binding in international law. Without, without this instrument, there would be a clash in domestic law because contrary provisions would apply both EU rules and new domestic rules simultaneously. Um, given, given, as I said earlier to the Prime Minister, given the fact that the commencement order itself uh, has not yet been brought into force, could my right honourable friend give me the lawful authority whereby the decision that was endorsed by the authority of Sir Tim Barrow was consistent with the virees of the original enactment uh, under the Withdrawal Act itself in 2018, Section 1? Um. <coughs> Well, Mr Speaker, I will, I will try to give my honourable friend a brief answer now, and I think probably the best thing then is, is for me to, or my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State, to write formally and swiftly to him in his uh, capacity as Chair of the um, European Scrutiny Committee so that he has that set out. So I'm, I, well, no, Mr Speaker, I'm not giving away, because I do actually want to try and give my honourable friend the, the uh, short answer that I, I promised a, a second ago. The, the purpose of the, uh, extent, of the uh, SI is to reflect the extension agreed between the United Kingdom and the European Union. Um, and the Government will now therefore delay the commencement of the repeal of the European Communities Act. A commencement order is required under Section 25.4 of the EU Withdrawal Act in order to give effect to this repeal. The timing of that commencement order will depend upon the date that we leave the European Union. And as a matter of both EU and international law, the effect of the European Council decision is that we are not leaving the European Union on the 29th of March. Therefore, it would be wrong to commence the repeal contained in Section 1 of the Act on that date. And in making that change, having sought an extension, the Government has acted on the basis of the resolutions that were passed by this House. Yep. Um, uh, about to, to, to that they did, the House did not want uh, to leave on the 29th of March without a, uh, a, a deal, and the House explicitly voted in favour of the Government seeking an extension to Article 50. Mr Speaker, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make some progress. I'm going to speak... Point of order, Kate Hoey. Point of order, Mr Speaker. I wonder, could you rule what the position would be then, constitutionally, if this statutory instrument, when it comes before us, changing the date which we've already in our legislation, was not accepted by this House, does EU law overrule our Parliament? Yes. As a matter of general practice, it is well established that EU law trumps UK national law. I'm not saying anything controversial there. As to the particular circumstances here, uh, the answer is that I might well pronounce upon it, but I would be extremely foolish to do so off the top of my head. And therefore, I may be able to sate the curiosity of the Honourable Lady, which will be widely shared across the House, but I'm afraid it's not within my gift to do so now. Better to give a valid and informative answer later than an invalid, uninformative and potentially misleading answer now. Minister. Uh, Mr. 
Mr Speaker, without the instrument, there would be a clash in domestic law because contradictory provisions would apply both EU rules and new domestic rules simultaneously. It is therefore important that the instrument is approved by Parliament so that we can ensure that our statute book accurately reflects the fact that the UK will now remain a member state until at least 11pm on the 12th of April. Now, if I can turn, Mr Speaker, briefly to the uh, amendments that you have selected, other than, other than, other than those, uh, uh, other than Amendment A, which I think we have already debated uh, at some length. And if I can turn, therefore, to Amendments D and, uh, and F. On Amendment D, um, I mean, as, as I said earlier, the, the Prime Minister and I have had some constructive meetings with uh, members, uh, all members from the uh, main opposition party uh, in, in recent days, and uh, the Prime Minister met the Leader of the Opposition earlier this afternoon. And on that basis, I would say to the right honourable gentleman opposite that the amendment is not necessary. But I'd also say this that, that the official opposition's amendment demonstrates one thing very clearly, which is that none of the changes that that amendment seeks to secure are changes to the withdrawal agreement. And the inference I draw from that is that the official opposition now actually supports the withdrawal agreement, and I hope that when the right honourable gentleman comes to speak, he will be able to confirm that he and his party accept that all possible deals with the European Union include this withdrawal agreement, and that indeed that is the clear uh, will of the European Council also. Now, I understand completely the um, motive behind Amendment F in the name of the Right Honourable Lady of the Member for Derby South. It instructs the Government to report by the 9th of April about how we would ensure that the United Kingdom did not leave without a deal if the deal had not been approved by that point. And consistently through this process, the Government has accepted that we will need to come back to this dispatch box in circumstances that the House have not supported a withdrawal agreement by the end of this week. And I recognise that the House has also now voted twice against leaving the European Union without a deal. But I, I do have to say to the uh, Right Honourable Lady and her co-sponsors that, that there are only two options which, in the circumstances envisaged in the amendment, would be before the House at that stage. I mean, there is the option, and that was called for by the Honourable Member for Perth and North Perth uh, earlier, of a, of a revocation of Article 50. But, of course, that is not a temporary measure. It is not a, uh, a mere stay in exit proceedings. The Court of Justice of the European Union has made it very clear that revocation would have to be both per permanent and taken a decision taken in, in good faith. Or, I, is it or, Mr Speaker, we could ask for a long extension. But that would mean running elections to the European Parliament nearly three years after the vote of the British public to leave. And of course it would also rely on the EU agreeing to such a long extension, which would by no means be assured. And unless the House were prepared to support one of those two options, and whatever the Right Honourable Lady might wish, the legal default under European law would be that the treaties would cease to apply and we would have to leave without a deal. So the way forward is for the House to accept the deal, and in particular this week, to approve the withdrawal agreement to secure the extension to the 22nd of May. Mr Speaker, if Parliament comes together and backs the Brexit deal, we will leave the European Union by the 22nd of May. We can then end three years of divisive debate and uncertainty and allow the country to move on towards a new future outside the European Union and devote ourselves to the important work of negotiating that deep and special partnership with our European friends and neighbours, which this party promised in its election yes. manifesto. 
The Government will make every effort to ensure that we are able to leave with a deal and move our country forward and to allow those who voted leave and those who voted remain to come together in looking to the future. And it is in that spirit that I commend this motion to the House. Yeah. The question is as on the order paper. Sir Keir Starmer. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister has got herself and the Government into a, into a hopeless position. Having disregarded views from across this House for the best part of two years, the Government now finds itself with a deal it just can't get through this House, and time has almost run out. And today, we see that they sort of agree with the initiative to break the impasse, but don't agree with it also. Uh, and it has to be seen in this context. The Prime Minister's lost control of the meaningful vote. In truth, we've got no idea when or if it's going to be put again or whether it's winnable. I listened carefully to what the Prime Minister said this, morning, uh, this afternoon. She said she gauged there still was not sufficient support for the deal, but she'd continue discussions so that she could bring forward a vote this week. Mr Speaker, we've been in that loop since the 10th of December. Since the 10th of December. I don't think there's enough support. I'm going to have further discussions and I'm going to put the vote again. She's lost control of that process. She's also lost control of the negotiations. That much is clear from the EU Council's decision last Thursday. When the question was put to the Government what happens if the meaningful vote fails, there was no answer. And that created a real anxiety that we could crash out this Friday without a deal. Uh, and it was in those circumstances that the EU acted as it did in putting forward the dates of the 12th of April and the 22nd of May. But it was a loss of control by the Government in the very negotiations. The Prime Minister also appears to have lost control of her party. Um, there have been too many jokes already about whether the uh, right honourable member, a uh, gentleman, is the deputy prime minister or the putative prime minister. I won't repeat them. I'll scratch them for my speech. But it is quite clear that control of the party has gone. Mm. Uh, and tonight, Mr. Speaker, I think it is likely that the prime minister and the government are going to lose control of Parliament and of the process in circumstances where, arguably, they don't need to. If they'd acted only last week, um, because the sense that we've got to move forward has been here. It was in the debate last week. It's not new today. It was clear, I think, that many members of this House want to find a way forward um, and want to break the impasse, feel a duty to break the deadlock. Um, that, that was the subject matter of last week's debate. And so instead of a constructive discussion about how we do it, we will divide probably on this motion um, this moment. Uh, I, I, I heard the cry before me first, so I will give way. I'm, I'm, extreme, I'm extremely grateful. And on that point about trying to break the impasse, the manifesto of the Conservative Party has been cited. But isn't it the case that manifestos, in order to be implementable, need to win a mandate? And uh, the Conservative Party did not win a mandate at the last general election because a mandate would mean having an overall majority in this House. And doesn't that provide, contrary to what the Brexit Secretary said, the room for the government to be able to be more flexible uh, on this matter. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm grateful um, for that and agree with the sentiment. And I've, I have stood here and been very critical about the red lines that the Prime Minister put in place at the beginning of the process, and I've always seen them as the cause of the problem. But today isn't really about the inquisition into that, um, although there will have to be that. It's, it's, it's actually about a different question, which is can we find um, a way forward? And I do, I honestly think, I honestly think that many members across this House want to find a way forward and have been working to that end. Uh, I will give way. I, uh, I thank the, uh, the, the Honourable Noble Gentleman for giving way. The Prime Minister was rightly questioned earlier by members of our benches to say that if the House were to come together on indicative votes and find a way forward, would she honour it and be bound by it? The Prime Minister was unwilling to say that she would. Could I inquire then, if this House comes forward and finds a majority for a deal that is different from that of the Labour Party policy, would we be bound by it and would we be whipping in favour of it? Well, I, I, I listened carefully to what the Prime Minister said, and I am going to say something about that in a minute. Um, I think what she was saying is that she wouldn't say in advance 
whether she would be bound, and we need to probe that because that's an important question. But, but we're getting slightly ahead of ourselves. I think the process that is envisaged is the process that, in the first instance, simply tests where there is a majority. It's actually looking at different propositions and seeing whether there is a majority in the House. And we need to get to that stage. I will give way. I'm most grateful. Um, I'm sure that the Honourable Gentleman understands that although the amendment in question, Amendment A, is in the name of the member for West Dorset, in reality there are only about 14 or 15 Conservatives, maybe slightly less, on that amendment. Therefore, to all intents and purposes, it is the numbers on the opposition benches which would carry it if it did. How does he answer the charge that this is inconsistent with our constitutional accountable government understanding order 14? And how does he answer the question that the attempt to do this would effectively seek to reverse the referendum result and also the Withdrawal Act itself? Well, uh, I, I, I honestly can't see how exploring whether there's a majority for a different approach um, is inconsistent with anything we've done so far. It's actually what we should have done two years ago. Yeah. It's what we should have done two years ago. Because the referendum answered just one question, which is whether more people would rather be in or out of the EU. It didn't answer the next question, huge question, which is if out, what sort of future relationship? That required very serious and considered discussion and really needed a discussion in this House to see if we could reach agreement. I will give way and then I'll give way behind me. Yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the Honourable Gentleman a moment ago asked a very serious question about whether the Labour Party would regard itself as bound to give support to any majority that emerges. The same question that we were putting to the government. Uh, the, the whole thing is pointless if the Labour Party is going to whip on all these indicative votes and then if a majority emerges is going to whip against that if it's not consistent with its manifesto which also did not get the majority support of the public at the last election. We resolved all this in 1972 and I apologise I don't normally go back into the depths of history <laughs> by having free votes on each side because it was, would have been fatuous for the front bench to try to go in this process. So will the Labour Party have free votes and will the Labour Party be bound by what other majorities might emerge from the indicative voting? Once we, if this passes tonight, there will be an intense discussion about how the process takes place and what the options are. When we see those options, we, the Labour Party, will take decisions about how to work. Well, no, 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 j just let me, com let me complete this. Just let me complete this point. If one of the options is no deal, we'll whip against it. Of course we'll whip against it, and if that's the outcome, we'll reject it. So of course we need to see the option. Yes. I thank my right honourable friend for giving way, and I'm glad to hear him say that the Labour Party will whip against No Deal, yeah, yeah. because these are my constituents' jobs that we are talking about here. But can I ask uh, my honourable friend if he agrees with me that these questions about the Constitution are not new, because, Mr Speaker, by definition, <coughs> under our Constitution, the thing that wins votes in this House is the Government. So it was hardly backbenchers who broke that convention in, uh, under our Constitution. Well, I, I, I'm grateful for that uh, intervention, and, and I agree. And in a sense, we're only in this place because there's no other way to break the deadlock or the impasse. I will give way, and then I'm going to make some progress. Thank my right honourable and learned friend for giving way. Does he agree with me that if the Prime Minister had not tried to exclude Parliament completely from having a say and had to be dragged kicking and screaming by the Supreme Court to allow us to legislate on triggering Article 50, if she had had a proper cross-party process and a national debate with a green paper and a proper white paper, yeah, yeah, yeah. instead of springing things on this House already decided at the last possible minute, then there would be considerably more goodwill for her in this place, and there would be a chance for us to have done what should have been done to get the Withdrawal <coughs> uh, Act and the deal through Parliament, because it would have been done properly, and now we are scrambling. Um, at the last possible minute, simply because she has not done the job properly. Yeah. Well, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And you know, it is a matter of record that the Prime Minister did not want to vote even on triggering Article 50. Yeah. And we only get a vote on that because of a Supreme Court decision. The Prime Minister didn't want a meaningful vote. 
We only got that in the teeth of the government whipping against it because we won a vote. It is true that the government has whipped strongly against any amendments about objectives every time, including one in the summer where it was a very controversial uh, whipping exercise that threw up a debate about maternity um, leave. So the idea that the government has been genuinely open to a debate about this and willing to listen to where the House is is just not true. Um, and, and, and it is a you know, we really, really ought to have gone through this exercise two years ago. But I do understand the argument now that we are where we are and we've now got to find a way forward, which is why um, we support this um, motion. I will just make some progress and I will give way again in just a moment. Um, but as we go, if we are to make, a, if we're to find a way forward, I think we need to be clear about what we're not prepared to do. And there's no way forward that includes blaming members of this House for the mess that we're in. There's no way forward that can include whipping up a sense of people versus MPs. There's no way forward based on the notion that members of this House who have persistently and forcefully advanced their views, whatever they may be in across the House, are indulging in some kind of illegitimate exercise. They're not. They're making important points on behalf of their constituents um, and in the national interest. They're doing their job. Um, and I, I heard the Prime Minister say earlier that she didn't intend her comments last week to have that effect. And I'm now not sure what I'm more concerned about. One, that she made the comments, or secondly, that she didn't appreciate how they would actually be heard in the environment we're uh, living in. But we cannot... We, I'll give away in just a minute. Um, nor can we find a way forward that's based simply on the proposition of putting and re-putting the same meaningful vote. Meaningful, the, the, the fact we're even discussing meaningful vote three, um, or even four, um, only has to be said to be seen to be absurd. The vote, the, the deal has been roundly rejected twice. We need now to move on, and I hope tonight that we can begin that process. Uh, I will give way. The right honourable and learned gentleman for giving way. I know he will have listened with great care to what the uh, Cabinet Secretary has said about the government's alternative if Amendment A fails to win a majority. Uh, does he share my concern that the government will only, in effect, allow indicative votes on the political declaration and the assumption is, is that the withdrawal agreement will go through cannot be touched or amended and in that event is this nothing more than a government ruse to get through the with the, the withdrawal amendment by some backdoor method no. well I'm, I'm great i'm grateful for that intervention i did listen very carefully to what the uh, uh, minister for the cabinet office said in relation to withdrawal agreement i think in relation to uh, the government's proposal and, and, and I, this is no disrespect to the right honourable um, gentleman, because I do respect him, but I think the, the trust in the government is not where it should be. Yeah. Uh, 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 and that isn't to disrespect anybody on the front bench sitting there. But it is to say this. When we voted to take no deal off the table and on extension, we were voting um, on the basis of the words that the Minister from the Cabinet Office said from that dispatch box about... Um, a short extension in the event that the meaningful vote failed being um, reckless. And therefore, when the letter was written to President Tusk last week, some of us were taken aback and did not think it reflected what we'd actually decided in this House. And, and that is one of the problems now in relation to this exercise, because uh, there is a lack of trust that if this amendment uh, is not passed this evening, that we may find <laughs> that we're not where we thought we would be when we get to Wednesday or Thursday or Friday. It wouldn't be the first um, time. Mr Speaker, I'm going to make some um, progress. I, I will give way in just a minute and then I'll make some progress just for now. Mr, Mr. Speaker, the, the decision of the European Council to grant an extension on Article 50 was a necessity and, in truth, the only way to prevent leaving without a deal on March the 29th. But I've said any extension must be for a purpose, which is why we need to come together and decide that purpose. Um, and... Um, the Chancellor of the Duchess of Lancaster said two weeks ago, and he's really elaborated on today, that um, the government would consult the usual channels with the other parties and work to provide the process by which the House could form a majority to take things forward. So it, it seems that the government agree with what 
the amendment tonight is intending to try to achieve. Um, if it goes through, obviously Parliament or MPs will decide the options, which is right. Um, but the government says that will give too much control to MPs. But then they go on to say, but if it doesn't go through, we'll provide the time. And as for the options, that should be for MPs. So, in fact, if they're true to what they're saying, the control goes to MPs to decide the options in any event. So the easiest thing would be simply to signal that they accept the amendment and we could foreshorten the debate and move forward and then start the discussion about how that's actually going to work. Uh, um, uh, Mr Speaker, I just, I'll complete this and then I'll give way. Uh, our amendment, Amendment D in our name, uh, seeks to achieve that purpose. Amendment A in the name of the Right Honourable Member for West Dorset and others does so. And we will be supporting both of those amendments um, this evening. Uh, I will give way. I'm grateful to my honourable friend for giving way. Does he agree it's important not just that MPs can determine um, the options that are voted on, but how those options are voted on? Many honourable members would be concerned if one was voted on after another rather than all at the same time. And the benefit of Amendment A is that it allows precisely that for MPs to vote on all of those options at the same time, as well as determining what those options are. I'm grateful for that intervention. It, it, it anticipates my next sentence, uh, which says we recognise that members will have different views on how the process should go forward. And, and, and there will have to be intense discussion over the next couple of days as to how that um, operates. But it needs to be a process that allows us to arrive at a majority view and a sustainable majority view. I did say I'd give away. I'm very grateful to my right honourable learned friend. Can I just put on record the utterly fantastic job he and his team have done on, on this issue to, to date. I just wondered if he could perhaps try and answer the question that the Prime Minister and the Duchy of the uh, Lancaster has failed to answer when I've placed it twice already this afternoon. And that is in the Prime Minister's statement. It says, unless this House agrees to it, no deal will not happen. What does he surmise that means? What do you think the government is trying to achieve? Well, I think... It's a version of what's gone before, which is to, on the one hand, say we accept that there's no majority for no deal in this House, and there certainly isn't, and I don't think there ever has been, but at the same time leave the threat of no deal dangling by some kind of legal default. If that has meaning, and I hope it does, I think it ought to commit the government to take whatever steps are necessary in order to avoid no deal. Otherwise, it's meaningless, and it's really important that that is established. Um, I'm going to make some. Uh, I'm going to. Uh, I will give way, and then I really am going to make some progress. To my honourable noted friend, it's on that very point. Isn't this another example of the double speak that we've come to expect from the government? And our concern here this evening is that we are witnessing another example of double speak and indeed potentially double dealing, because the implication of the acceptance, if you like, of both the spirit of the uh, Letwin uh, proposal and indeed its effect, while saying that at the same time the government won't be bound by it and they won't tell us exactly whether they're going to do precisely what it says, makes us all suspect that it is another piece of trickery designed to get this taken off the table tonight, only to find that we are no further forward tomorrow. Well, I, I'm, I'm grateful for that intervention. I, I, I do think there's a trust issue. Uh, hopefully that can improve, but there is a trust issue. Um, and the letter to President Tusk was an example of that, because having supposedly taken no deal off the table, the only extension that was asked for was an extension in the event um, that the meaningful vote um, failed, um, rather than if it went through. And that left the prospect, um, but for what the EU Council decided last Thursday, of no deal this Friday, going back on the table just a week after we thought we'd taken it off the table. I do, I'm going to make some progress. Um, so we do need to get into uh, Wednesday. We need to have an intense discussion about how the votes on Wednesday to be taken and see if we can reach consensus um, about that and actually reach uh, a majority and find where that lies. We do need to consider the credible options. Labour have long advocated a close economic relationship, including a customs union and a single market alignment, but we have also made clear our support for a public vote as a lock on any deal that the Prime Minister passes. 
and the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition I have met with colleagues to discuss these proposals and the other ideas that have been put forward by other colleagues. What we need to do now is to agree the process for having a proper debate uh, I, I will, uh, uh, and to look at those and other credible options. I will give way. Extremely generous. Does he agree with me that there is a difference between uh, the people's vote, public vote option versus the others? The others relate to a substantive route forward on Brexit. A public vote is a way of ensuring that there is a broad consensus of the public behind whatever that consensus this House may find itself falling, uh, find favour for. That's a very, very important intervention, and obviously there will be discussions over the next two days. But the basic proposition that um, the House needs to decide the substance of any deal that it might be able to support, um, and arguably to look at the process around it um, separately, is important because some of these options are not like for like options in the sense that some are about substance and some are about process, and it would be perfectly possible to say, to, to make the argument that uh, uh, if there is to be a deal, it ought to be what we consider to be the least damaging deal, um, and we could have an argument about what that looks like, mm -hmm. but equally um, it would be possible to say that whatever deal that was at the end of that exercise, it ought to be uh, subject to the lock or safeguard of some sort of confirmation vote. Now, I'm, I don't know, I'm not anticipating how the votes would go, but I can see that there's one of those decisions is about the substance of the issue, the second is about the process. We're going to have to grapple with that before Wednesday. I will give way. I'm most grateful to the uh, Right Honourable and Learned Gentleman for giving way because I agree entirely with what he's just said, as indeed I agree with my Right Honourable friend's question to him. And he may also agree that it's going to be really important in the course of this debate and how we structure it uh, that we make sure that we can provide reassurance that uh, members can vote for what they see as preferred outcomes without in any way having the sense that they might be forfeiting the right to also the insistence that that has got to go to the public, whatever that it might be. I agree with that because I think otherwise we inhibit the likelihood of actually finding um, a majority and that therefore will require quite careful thought going into um, Wednesday. I'm going to, I will give way in just a minute again but I'm going to make so, some remarks because assuming for the moment we can find a process which most members are content with and that we can then move towards a majority. Uh, view and it may take some time um, and I, I for one am I'm troubled by the idea that in one afternoon all of this can be solved it may be that all we can do is start down a process of finding a majority and I think it'd be wrong to rush at this at this stage of the exercise but assuming that can be done it does then raise the million dollar question which is if the house does find a majority will the government accept the result I do understand and respect the position of the Prime Minister who says, well, I need to know what the options are and what the result is before I can answer that question. I do understand the logic of that, and it's a fair point. But what I don't want is wrapped up in that perfectly reasonable logical answer to find that in a week or two or whenever it may be, that whatever the outcome is that is agreed upon by a majority, it will never be accepted uh, by the government and we're back to where we started. And that's uh, my concern about the exercise. So when the government says it will go into it in good faith, I think that has to mean that if there is a majority, um, the government will look very seriously at supporting where that majority view is and not simply rule it out. Because if we go back to the red lines, which is the very thing we're trying to break, um, or in other words, if the government applies its own red lines to any outcome and says it doesn't fit our red lines, then there's not much point going through the exercise in the first place, because it's precisely to remove those red lines that we're going um, forward. I, I will give way. Thanks. My right honourable and learned friend from Gavin is making a very powerful point about the kind of absurdity of an ill-designed referendum that asked a very simplistic uh, answer to a very complex question. 
and no one can really understand what that 52 per cent wanted to vote to leave because it was so ill-defined and so massive and the government has arrogantly assumed that it has a monopoly on wisdom of what that leave vote meant and actually holds parliament in contempt and it's a pursuit of it um, is it not the reality that the as the Chancellor of the Executive said, something like a confirmatory public vote would be actually entirely logically coherent. And it's bizarre that the Prime Minister, despite not having a mandate, despite not having a majority, seems so pig-headed, not actually reaching out to the House of, Pop, House of Commons to actually pursue that sort of consensus-building approach. I'm, I'm grateful for that intervention. I mean, on this question of the government accepting the outcome, I do think that if the government simply rejects whatever is the outcome of this exercise, it will be doubling down on one of the big mistakes of the last two years, which is to push Parliament away and not let Parliament express its view as to where the majority is, which is, why, which is one of the reasons we're in this mess. I'll, I'll give way in just one moment. Um, because for two and a half years the Government has pushed Parliament away at every turn, um, and we need now to find a mechanism, albeit a constitutionally innovative mechanism, to actually break through um, that. Now, I, I will. Does my friend, my right and left friend, not recognise that in some areas there is huge opposition amongst the electorate to having uh, European elections? But there is the opportunity through the Withdrawal Agreement Bill, should it ever be reached, for every single option being potentially proposed on Wednesday to be put as amendments, including the customs union. Uh, has my right and friend considered this as an option? I, I have, not least because the honourable members raised it with me, I think, last week, uh, and therefore I have considered it. I think the difficulty is this, that um, certainly the EU argue that once the withdrawal agreement and the political declaration are agreed, you can't, through domestic legislation, change the terms of those documents. And therefore, actually, whatever amendment you put down to the legislation, it couldn't alter the terms of the political declaration. So it's not accurate to say that all of this could somehow be swept up with the um, implementation bill, because the words in the document that you're seeking to implement have to be the words that the House is happy with and thus has agreed before we get to that stage. There are some things that could be dealt with in the implementation bill. I don't, I don't uh, quarrel with that, but, but, the e but the EU will not countenance this House changing the terms of their agreement through amendments to the bill. It was one of the concerns the Government rightly put in relation to the meaningful vote. When we were saying there should be amendments to the meaningful vote, the Government's position was you can't really have amendments because this House can't amend the substance of the document. I will give way and then I am going to make some progress because I realise how long I've been. And would my right and friend not also accept, with the proposal put to him this afternoon of having separate votes on the political declaration and the withdrawal agreement, that it is the political declaration there is up for steering what happens in the next phase, whereas the EU has made clear that the withdrawal agreement itself is not for renegotiation with anyone at any time. Well, well, I certainly accept the proposition that the EU has said the withdrawal agreement is not for reopening at any stage, and they have resisted that for month after month after month from the Government. Uh, but, I, but I do remind myself and the House that in the letter that Presidents Tusk and Juncker wrote to the Prime Minister in, I think, January, they were very clear the withdrawal agreement and the political declaration are part of, I think in their words, the same negotiated package. Um, and I also remind myself on the House that under Section 13 itself, the, two, uh, the, the, the withdrawal agreement and the political declaration go together. Now, it doesn't mean there aren't different views on the two on the agreement on the one hand and the declaration on the other, but they are part of the same negotiated package. Mr Speaker, I'm going to um, make some progress um, because I want to indicate that we will also, uh, we would have uh, supported Amendment C and we do support Amendment F in the name of the Right Honourable Member for Derby um, South. Um, that obviously addresses a different point, which is how to prevent uh, a no-deal outcome and ensuring this House can shape the extension process. They were matters that we thought we'd cleared up some weeks ago, but I think it is important that we come back to that amendment so that we can um, reassert the position um, going um, forward. But, Mr Speaker, um, tonight really is about the opportunity to bring to an end the Government's 
um, failed approach. For two years, they have not put up a credible plan or really listened to um, other alternatives. Um, I used to say the Prime Minister was surviving by the week. I changed that to saying she was surviving by the day. Um, now she appears to be surviving by the hour to get through to Wednesday. But really, enough's enough. We can't go on like this. The country deserves better, and Parliament must take back control. And we've got the chance to do that tonight, and we should do it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes. <laughs> Sir Oliver Letwin. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, um, Amendment Day has already been much discussed in the course of this debate, and I, I don't um, want to detain the House for very long. Uh, I do want, first of all, though, to say what it is trying to do and what it is not trying to do. Um, in the first place, it is not some kind of, of massive constitutional revolution, though I know that uh, some of my honourable friends and others have suggested it is. The, the truth is that, as you yourself said, Mr Speaker, earlier in the debate, the House, since its inception, has owned its standing orders. And in fact, under the principle of comity, one of the most fundamental principles of our Constitution, the courts have never sought to intervene in the proceedings of the House of Commons and the House of Lords and have recognised that the House, in each case, controls its own proceedings. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, the idea that it's an ancient constitutional principle that the government should control the order paper is slightly anhistorical, if that's the right word, because it started in 1906, which, as far as I'm aware, is not part of our ancient constitution. Uh, for about four or five hundred years, uh, things which either were or were very much like the House of Commons controlled their own order papers, and that changed at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, but what didn't change was the fundamental point that the way that standing orders are decided is by a majority vote in the House of Commons, and therefore they can be adjusted by a majority vote in the House of Commons, and if so adjusted, then what applies is the adjusted version. And that's actually what happens every time that there's a private member's bill Friday, uh, when, astonishingly, the government does something which apparently we're now entreated to regard as utterly revolutionary, which is that it hands over to private members the opportunity to put forward bills, which, uh, according to this uh, uh, soi-disant constitutional theory which has now been invented, must be a kind of revolution because it's not the government putting forward a bill, but in fact we've been doing it for years perfectly happily. So there's no revolutionary uh, intent here at all. Uh, the second point I want to make is what the amendment does do, and it does exactly what has been described in the foregoing debate, namely it provides simply nothing more an opportunity for the House of Commons to begin, and I want to stress the word begin, the process of working its way towards uh, identifying a way forward that can command a majority in this House. And uh, I just want to reflect for a second on uh, my own personal history in this matter. Uh, I, I find sometimes from the uh, communications, not always utterly polite, that I receive from various uh, quarters on my uh, iPhone, that it's supposed that I have from the beginning attempted to uh, destroy the government's efforts to uh, uh, carry out an orderly Brexit. Now, this is obviously a, a, a more amusing story than the real one, but the real one is very sad. It's a very ordinary. Uh, I started as an entirely loyal member of the Conservative Party. I'd never voted against the Conservative whip in my entire parliamentary career, not once. Um, and, and what's more, uh, although I voted Remain in the referendum, I was absolutely determined that we should continue uh, our proceedings by uh, ensuring that we fulfilled the mandate of the British people and left the European Union. And for a very long while, although I personally thought from the very beginning that the Prime Minister was unwise to set out her red lines, I swallowed my concerns about that and uh, utterly supported her in her endeavour to get her version of leave across the line. And indeed, uh, on frequent occasions, as several of my honourable and right honourable friends will recall, acted as a kind of broker to try to put together yes. the, uh, my ERG colleagues with uh, other colleagues now sitting in various parts of the House uh, to produce results, some of which are now encoded as a matter of fact in uh, Section 13. Um, it was my endeavour to make this a process which did actually enable the Prime Minister to get to the end of the road successfully. And just finally on that, I have actually fulfilled that by trying to vote for her on every occasion on which she's brought a Section 13 motion. And uh, I apologise to members opposite uh, 
for saying that I will again do that if the Prime Minister brings a, a meaningful vote, three or four or infinity. Uh, I will go on voting for the Prime Minister's deal because I happen to think it's perfectly OK. I, I'm very conscious mem many members of the House don't agree with me. The problem we've been facing, and this is something on which we can all agree, all of us, all 650 of us can agree, is that we haven't been able to get a majority for her deal. This is the fact. And that is a problem. And it's a problem because if you don't have a majority for that deal uh, and you want to leave the EU, uh, then you are forced down only one of two possible tracks. One is to find an alternative, and the other is to have no deal. And it was at the point, I will in a moment, it was at the point when I discovered or, or surmised a few months back that there was a real possibility that the Prime Minister I think by mistake rather than on purpose, was going to end up by taking us out without a deal, without having adequately prepared for that, that I became so concerned that I started to work on a cross-party basis with many colleagues in both, uh, on both sides of the House to try to find a solution. And this uh, uh, modest attempt to provide the House with an opportunity to vote in the majority, in favour of an alternative way forward, is simply part of that process. I give way. For, for him to give way. And I think there is a sentiment in this House that there is the, we need to compromise somehow. And I've asked the Prime Minister earlier, for me it was unthinkable to ever vote for a Brexit deal. Why is it so unthinkable for the members opposite to agree to, to support a people's vote for whatever Brexit deal we come together for? I think what I'd say to the Honourable Lady is that if we go through the process which I hope we can inaugurate uh, this evening, one of the things we will all have to do is to seek compromise. If we all vote for that which is our first preference, I think we almost know that we will never get to a majority solution. I don't believe there is a majority in favour of the first preferences of any person in this House. Yes. I do thank the Honourable Gentleman for giving way. We have heard today from the Prime Minister and we also heard from my Honourable Friend, the Member for Holborn and St Pancras, that there is not going to be an immediate guarantee that whatever majority we find in this House will become the established policy of either of the two main political parties. And Does he share my concern that we may actually end up in a situation where we manifest a majority for a deal that is not quite right for the Conservative Party, is not quite right for the Labour Party, and then the whip system kicks in and then suddenly there is no majority in Parliament at all. And in my mind, that makes no deal very dangerous and very real. The, the danger that the Honourable Gentleman uh, speaks of is real. Um, we all face it. Uh, there is a solution to it, which is to ensure that as we approach a majority, uh, we sufficiently discuss that, uh, not only amongst all of us on the back benches, but also with the two front benches, to ensure that there is what I think the uh, uh, shadow Brexit Secretary rightly referred to uh, a few moments ago as a sustainable majority. What we need is not just a majority for something, but a majority for something that will continue to persist as the various stages have to be carried through. And that must be our aim. Of course, they can wait. Uh, Who's every word I've agreed so far, if we say so with respect. Uh, but he just reached a few moments ago the key moment, which is, as his amendment doesn't set out precisely the form that the indicative votes will take, there's a real danger that if everybody votes for their first preference, we won't produce a majority for anything. Now, his amendment does not set out the basis upon which the indicative vote motions are to be tabled. Uh, how are we to resolve the method by which we table them? Because it's the opinion of my, the Honourable Member for Bishop Auckland and myself that the single transferable vote is the best way of steering people to one conclusion. It will force compromise, apart from those who will only vote for their first preference. Unless he has another better alternative, how does he guard against the danger of nothing getting a majority? Well, my, my uh, right honourable friend is asking what is clearly one of the right questions, and uh, I give him two answers. The first is 
I think we need to think very seriously, both in the next 24 hours, if this amendment does pass, about the shape of the business of the House motion for Wednesday, which will determine the process for Wednesday, to answer his question on that front, uh, and indeed about how the process will carry forward beyond that. Um, my own view is that at least to begin with, it may be wiser simply to disclose where the votes lie on a plain vanilla basis, certainly, and uh, the uh, Honourable Lady opposite made this point very forcefully a few moments ago, certainly on the basis of all the voting going on at once with pink slips in the uh, lobbies at the end of the debate and not sequentially so we don't have gaming of uh, sequence, uh, but on the basis where we discover which propositions that have been put forward command significant support and which do not, in the hope that actually as politicians, and we should remind ourselves we are not just an ordinary electorate, we are politicians, we have spent our lives in this business, that we can in the succeeding few days zero in on something that could be a compromise that could get a majority, having observed the lie of the land. I don't at all, and this is my second, uh, part of, uh, the second part of my answer, I don't at all discount the possibility that at a later stage, and I'm sure that there will have to be a later stage, and indeed I hope that the business of the House motion will book a slot for a later stage, that we should resort to some other method to crystallise the majority if we find that it's otherwise difficult to do. Of course, that's a brief intervention. Given the process could take a few days more, as my Rodham friend clearly explains, doesn't that underline we better crack on on Wednesday? And if the government won't commit to Wednesday for some peculiar unknown reason, if it doesn't and it's wind up tonight, it's absolutely essential that we pass his amendment. I find myself in a very odd position uh, of being slightly harder line even than my right honourable friend on this. I'm afraid I think we have to press this amendment tonight because, because I don't believe the government has yet got a clear view actually of how it would conduct this process. And I think the terms of the amendment, which have been very carefully considered over quite a long time, are structured in a way that maximises our flexibility and our capacity as a House to work together. Of course, we should work with both front benches on formulating Wednesday in the best possible way and producing a business of the House motion, which, if possible, is a matter of consensus, but that's best done under the framework of this amendment, and we should press it tonight. Yes, of course. Uh, the right honourable gentleman for, for giving way, and I'll be supporting his amendment tonight, and I'm happy to put my name uh, on it to support. And it, it, what he said about uh, not rushing through this all in one day, I think, is a very important point. Um, I think you know, we do need time. I think there's reasonable concerns that people don't want to suddenly be deciding on the future relationship, potentially, of the country for 40 years um, uh, in a couple of hours in here. So I was pleased to hear what he said about um, this process being a start of a process. Um, but also, would he agree with me that the importance of us all getting together and setting that business house motion is that we ensure it is a fair, balanced process that enjoys the confidence of all sides of the House, all parties, all persuasions in this, and that it's not seen as you know, loaded to one direction or the other, or indeed the government's policy. I very thoroughly agree with the Honourable Gentleman about that. Uh, I, I think it is possible, and should be possible for us at this juncture above all, to ensure that the uh, neutrality of the process is guaranteed. Of course we will have conflicting views about the ideal outcome, uh, but if we're to come together on a... Uh, 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 an outcome that all of us can tolerate and consequently achieves a sustainable majority, we are going to have to ensure that the process by which we have got to that is one that everybody recognises is fair and neutral as between the various options. Uh, of course I shall, but will, will, will the, uh, two, my two, uh, the two honourable uh, members uh, allow me? I did promise that I would give way to my, the right honourable lady, or, or not. So I think it's uh, just to confirm everything that the Honourable Gentleman has said about how he started off and continues to believe in the, the delivery of Brexit and his, his description of his journey is accurate, Mr Speaker, but he's answered my question because I, it was, will he push it to the vote and if he will, why? But I think he's made that very clear to the House. I'm delighted to be well, of course. The, um, member for West Dorset for giving way, and as he knows, I strongly support his amendment, and he is making an extremely important speech. Would he agree as well, though, that 
The, the government has effectively taken two years to get to this point. It is not unreasonable for the House in this unusual and difficult situation we are in to recognise that it is likely to take us more than one day to attempt to do what, frankly, the government should have done quite a long time ago. And can I therefore urge you, when he's thinking about this, this further steps, to uh, highlight the importance of us identifying a further day next week in order to be able to have similar uh, debates and discussions if we so need it to come to a conclusion, but also urging the government to also think about what it should be doing to provide for these further votes in order to come to a consensus and to recognise there may also need to be further binding votes in this process as well. I, 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 uh, unsurprisingly, uh, given the close cooperation there has been between us, I entirely agree with everything that the uh, Right Honourable Lady has just said. Uh, it, it is of the utmost importance that the business of the House motion, when it comes on Wednesday, should also provide for a further day uh, or days uh, in which to uh, take a process which begins on Wednesday and reach a successful conclusion. And of course it is also the case that we will have to attend to the question which has been discussed this evening and began to be aired when the Prime Minister was making her statement and answering questions on it, which is the question, what will the government do? if the House reaches a majority view, not for some unicorn, not for some ludicrous proposition which utterly contradicts common sense, but for a sensible way forward, uh, how do we persuade at that stage the government to allow that majority view to be implemented? That will be a major issue. Did, of course. I'm very grateful to the Right Honourable Gentleman for giving way, and as he knows, I support his amendment, and I'm going to vote for it tonight. And I'm delighted that he's agreed that we need to move to paper ballots and end some of the gamesmanship which has been going on. The Father of the House raised the issue of the voting system, so I won't repeat that. But in addition, there are two other points which we need to bear in mind. One is whether the votes are indicative or definitive, and maybe we might move from one to the other, as the Right Honourable Member for Pontefract and Castleton said. But the other one <laughs> is how an option gets onto the ballot paper, and that's also an extremely tricky, nice issue. And what I want to know from the Right Honourable Gentleman is whether he doesn't think we don't need time perhaps to amend the business of the House motion, because the way we do it is also a subject for discussion, as well as going on to do it. I was with the Honourable Lady just to the end, but not quite to the end. Uh, uh, I, I'm conscious that although the point that uh, her Right Honourable Friend made a, a, a minute or two ago is right, that we should allow ourselves a couple of days to do what should have been done over a couple of years. Uh, we are also under very considerable time pressure. There is a reality of the situation, which is that on the 11th, uh, we hit the buffers. And uh, therefore, I think we shouldn't spend too much time uh, debating the process. We should, if possible, uh, move forward on the basis of sufficient consensus about the process, not to have to debate it, and get on with the substance. And to that end, I think it would be sensible if we begin this process by allowing those members who wish to put forward alternatives to do so. And there are groups of people who support whatever it may be, uh, the people's vote as a confirmatory process or otherwise, uh, uh, Norway or uh, Norway Plus or uh, uh, the, the particular propositions hitherto put forward by the opposition or whatever it might be. I think we need to let those members in the ordinary way formulate their propositions in their own terms. Uh, Mr. Speaker has a long record, and previous speakers have had a long record, while we're at it, of finding a way of selecting those amendments that carry sufficient weight in terms of numbers and cross-party support and so on to be considered by the House by selecting them for debate. And I think that's a, a perfectly proper process to use. It doesn't involve anyone uh, of us uh, tilting the playing field. Uh, and uh, it enables us to proceed without too much further debate about the process. Um, I will, but then once I've done so, I'm going to conclude. He's being very generous. Can I say we'll be delighted to support his amendment? And the reason is, if the House controls this, 
it is likely that all of the options can be considered, yes. including revocation, which is the only thing we can do unilaterally. And I say that to him publicly now, partly as a pitch for it to be on the options paper, but mainly to say I rather lack the trust in the government that they would actually include all of the valid options if they were in control of the timetable. Yeah, Actually, I am very glad I did give way to the Honourable Gentleman, because first of all, I am obviously very grateful that uh, he and his colleagues will be supporting the amendment. Secondly, I wholeheartedly endorse what he says. Uh, personally, I am utterly opposed to revocation. I am also, actually, at the moment, wholly unpersuaded of the merits of a, a people's vote. But both of those are obviously serious things to consider. Incidentally, I am also radically opposed to no deal. Uh, uh, exit. But if uh, some of my colleagues wish to put forward that as a serious proposition, I think it is a serious proposition. It would need to be uh, debated. So, yes, it is essential that we should be able to look at all of the serious options, not, not wild unicorns, but things we could actually do and could actually uh, carry forward this, this process in one direction or another. And I feel very confident, Mr. Speaker, that when you look at sensibly phrased amendments of as motions of very different kinds, you will choose for debate all those which are serious possibilities that the House needs to consider. That is in the interest of the House and in the interest of the nation. I want just to end by, by mentioning one uh, uh, thing which uh, comes from a personal experience. And Colleagues on the Liberal Democrat benches may recall this, as well as some of my own uh, uh, honourable friends on these benches. There was a time in 2010 when this nation faced uh, another cliff edge. We were within days of uh, the Bank of England discovering that our creditors would not uh, finance the UK anymore. Uh, it was just after the 2010 election. Nobody had won the election. Uh, it was clear that nobody could form a government except by coalition. Uh, we were very heavily uh, indebted due to what had happened in 2008. And what we were told by the Governor of the Bank of England was that if a coalition was not formed pretty quickly, uh, he personally felt that the lenders would go on strike and we would have a meltdown. And, of course, there were then discussions between the Liberal Democrats and the Labour Party and between the Liberal Democrats and the Conservative Party. And I was a part of the Conservative Party team on that occasion. And I was informed uh, uh, when we had finished those negotiations and had brought them to a successful conclusion uh, that the cleverest and most experienced people in the civil service – and uh, incidentally, I don't wish to demean the civil servant, I hardly can because my wife is a senior civil servant uh, – had put their, minds, their collective minds to the task and formed teams in order to find out whether it was possible to have a coalition agreement either between the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats or between the Liberal Democrats and the Conservative Party. And they had worked this through in awesome detail. And they had convinced themselves that it was absolutely impossible to form a coalition. It could not be done. We sat down and four days later there was a coalition agreement. And why did that come about? It came about because it was politicians who sat down and weren't concerned with the kinds of things that people are concerned with when they are very brilliant administrators, but were concerned with trying to find out how to accommodate the essential requirements of the other side. This is, of course, the process that should have been gone through two years back yeah, yeah, in this yeah, connection. Yeah, yeah. But we have the opportunity to do it now, and I hope and pray that the House, if it does vote for this amendment, will not see this simply as a set of votes in the abstract but as the beginning of a process in which, by discovery of where the land lies, we can then come together and find a consensus and get a majority and carry forward in a sensible way. I'm terribly sorry, but I won't give way because I'm going to conclude. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Stephen Gethins. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, Mr Speaker, this morning I left my home not far from the town of St Andrews in my constituency to set off on my regular commute, like other members of this House in different parts of the United Kingdom, quite literally by plane, train and automobile. Like most weeks, like many of us, I had no idea when I'd be going home um, to my family and to my constituents. But unlike most weeks, I, my family and my constituents had no idea that by the time I got home, whether or not I would still be afforded the rights and privileges that, are, that EU citizens take as their own. 
What a state to be in all these years on. And this is why today, can I thank the Right Honourable Member for West Dorset and, and, and the Right Honourable Member for Derby South as well, and to, to their colleagues for, for, for the work that they've put in to their amendments that obviously we'll be backing this evening. And I thank them for that. But what a state to be in all these years on, because we're not here for any other reason than an attempt to offset a Tory civil war. This disaster is years in the making. And we're only in this situation because once upon a time David Cameron decided to call an EU referendum so that he could have avoided a full-blown Tory civil war. Now, there are many who will disagree with me in this yes. house. Yes. 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 Well, I'm not sure there are many who will disagree with me in saying that it's not working very well, is it? How's that attempt to avoid a Tory civil war going? Minister wants to intervene after that? No, I didn't think so. I didn't think so. Because we have a full blown civil war. And this is a Tory party determined to take the rest of us down with them as well. And what today's amendment gives us the opportunity to do is for the moment stave off that opportunity that they are trying to give to us. Because the Prime Minister continues to appeal to the hardliners in her own party rather than face up to the realities of minority government. But this is a lost cause. The Brexiteers who campaigned without any sort of plan are the ones who got us out of this mess. And frankly, the message to the Prime Minister must be, Mr Speaker, that they are unlikely to get us out of it. Now, it is not for me to judge Conservative Party management. The voters will have their opportunity to do that in due course. But what strikes me is just how enthralled this Conservative Party and this Prime Minister is to the extremists in her own party. And with that, I want to praise some of the members on the other side, because there are members who have stuck their neck out. There are members, and I disagree with them, and they disagree with me, but let's look at the way they've been treated. Now, the members for, um, for Grantham and yep. Stamford, who's in his place, and the member for Leicestershire South, and I disagree over plenty. And we disagree over Brexit. He wants us to leave the European Union. I don't. But he finds himself in a situation whereby when we see these, with these, these um, positive proposals, we don't always agree, or when we see one that's even accepted by the government, as was the case for the member for Leicester, Leicestershire South, the member present finds himself deselected, and the member for Leicestershire South finds himself sacked. And yet all along, and I disagree with them for this, they have backed the Prime Minister's deal. What does that tell you? What does that tell you about trying to find some kind of consensus? What does that tell you about trying to reach across? This is a government that is enthralled to the very extremes, and it is something that we cannot put up with any longer in this House. Let's just look at the invitation list to those who were treated to lunch at Chequers, the very people voting against the Prime Minister. This tells us everything about a Prime Minister who has lost control about her own, of her own party and hers who has um, dragged us into this folly. And I'll give way to the Honourable Lady because she's got some experience in this. I, I do. Indeed, <laughs> and I'm very grateful for giving way. Did it strike him as being quite perverse that the very people invited to Chequers were the very people who in December had sought a motion of no confidence yeah. in the Prime Minister as leader of the Conservative Party and had plotted against her? But is he also aware? There's a lot of Conservative associations hold their annual general meetings at the end of this week. And does he share my concern that too many honourable and right honourable members opposite will be more concerned about the outcome of those AGMs than the effect of a no deal or indeed any Brexit on their constituents? The, or, the Honourable Lady knows the Conservative Party much, Tick much better top. than I do, and it, and it shows, <laughs> and, and she makes a very, very valid point. Well, I don't know. And the point is this, Mr Speaker, <laughs> it is a small, elitist group of Conservative MPs, yep. all men, incidentally, who were vote, invited to Chequers, incidentally, who have failed, and failed spectacularly, on their pet, lifelong political project. Yep. Mr Speaker, 
I wouldn't let this lot anywhere near the TV remote in my house, never mind the most important decision that we have to make for generations. And I'll give way to the Honourable Lady. I'm very grateful for giving way. Can we extend that, can we extend that actually, to listen to the, apparently a mob of people that will rebel um, if ever we are not going to deliver this vote of the people? And nobody listens to the peaceful million, the five million people who want to actually revert our Article 50. They're not death threatening us, they're not mobbing us. They are just peaceful people, and yet we are worried about those keyboard warriors who will threaten us from um, the security of their homes. Is that not also wrong? Um, the argument lady makes a very powerful point about the way that millions protested peacefully on Saturday. And I'm delighted that our First Minister joined them, as did the leader of the Liberal Democrats, colleagues in the Labour Party, and even some Conservative colleagues as well. And they were right to have done so. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister is effectively out of power and we need to move on. Debating her particular position, which, as you have rightly pointed out, has been rejected twice overwhelmingly, means that it becomes more and more pointless to debate the Prime Minister's <coughs> deal with every passing hour. And the, and the opposition spokesperson was right to point that out too. The House of Commons must seize control of this process tonight so that we can hold those indicative votes and start, start to find out a, a way out of this mess. Now, we know from the UK government's own warnings that the Prime Minister's deal is not in the, Prime, uh, is not in the best interest of anybody in the UK. And we know that no deal is not in anybody's best interest either. And this Parliament has come together and has rejected both the Prime Minister's deal and no deal. Comprehensively, they have been Rejected. Would he give way on that? But having wasted almost three years, the government has run out, out of options and run out of ideas, and we need to step up. Now, believe it or not, Mr. Speaker, none of this should give us any pleasure. Where we are today is not a farce, it is now a tragedy, and a tragedy that is taking us all down with us. And I say somebody who, as you know, fundamentally wants Scotland to be an independent state, yeah. but it, gives me, yeah. it really gives me no pleasure when I speak to colleagues overseas and see that the UK's international reputation is broken. And that hurts all of us. And I, it doesn't give me any great pleasure, and I assure colleagues, it gives me no great pleasure to have to say that. When I was working in the European institutions, I can remember that overall in the EU, and I'm appealing to the Minister, I know, and I know the Minister works hard on this as well, that the UK could be a real force for good. Now, I didn't always agree with everything the UK was there for, but I acknowledge many of the positive contributions made by UK <coughs> citizens to the EU project. Now, I think it's right that all of us acknowledge that. What was more striking, however, was the way in which the UK and Ireland worked as the closest possible allies and partners in the European Union. For the first time in that troubled history, there was truly a working as a partnership of equals alongside other European states. Yep. Now, and again it gives me, and I suspect it gives the Irish no pleasure in this either, the boot has, which has historically been on the foot of the UK is now in the other foot. As Robert Cooper wrote in the FT, the smallest insiders, Dublin in the case of Brexit, matter more than the biggest outsiders, the UK. That tells us everything about solidarity and the working of the European Union. But even here, the Irish don't crow, but they've been honest brokers. The best friends any of us can possibly have, any of us can have, are our most critical friends. The ones that tell us the truth when we want to see it the least. And I've heard when these matters of truth have come out, Brexiteers getting enraged and annoyed at the truths that they dare speak from Dublin. Can I remind all members here that Ireland is independent and it is not coming back and it's not difficult to see why. Independent states thrive in the European Union. It is a means of strengthening democracy and sovereignty. 
The EU is a partnership of equals in a way that the UK simply is not. Now, I want to see the Scotland as a full and independent member state of the European Union. That would be healthier in our relationship as a modern, outward-looking nation, as the same way as it's been healthy for the Anglo-Irish relationship as well. Now, here in the UK, people are seeing through this mess. And, Mr Speaker, as we referenced earlier on, at the weekend, hundreds of thousands the length and breadth of the UK marched for our collective futures. Since then, and at the last look, the revocation of Article 50 petition and this is at the last look, has been signed by 5.5 million people, including 17 per cent of the electorate in my own constituency. Yeah. And that's not even the highest one in Scotland. Millions of people can see what this government cannot. And what this government clearly cannot see, but what these people can see, is that when you are careering towards the cliffs, you slam on the brakes. That's what they're there That's for. Right. On that point, will you give way? And let's not forget that Parliament has that power, as was recognised by the court, has that power because the UK Parliament throughout this has retained and always will retain in these circumstances sovereignty in a way that the Scottish Parliament does not. Spot the difference, everybody. Yeah. The UK Parliament, as a man member of the EU, retains sovereignty. The Scottish Parliament, as this process has shown us, does not. It may provide a mechanism for doing those all we represent untold damage in this article. And on that point, I'll give way to the Honourable Lady. Yeah, I'm grateful to uh, my Honourable Friend for giving way. He's making a very powerful speech. Yeah. Uh, I, wonder, I just want to ask him about something the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster said from the Treasury bench earlier, when he said that revoking Article 50 could only ever be done once, and it would be permanent and could never be reversed. Has he, like me, read the decision of the Grand Chamber of the Court of Justice? And does he, like me, agree that the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster has got that wrong? And if this House chose to revoke Article 50, it would be possible, possible at some point in the future to re-notify Article 50 notice, provided that was done in good faith. Well, as usual, my honourable and learned friend makes a very, very powerful point. I know she tried to intervene on the Chancellor of the Duchy, but I know that the Treasury bench will be listening to that and will be taking note of that as well. Do you know what really struck me today as well? We were told the biggest problem is the European elections. Yeah. Let me tell them something. The biggest problem with this is not the European elections. The biggest problem is not people um, taking part in a democratic election. <laughs> The biggest problem are the jobs the government's plans are, are, are going to be costing, the public services that will be hit by this Brexit, yep. Yep. and the opportunities for future generations yeah, that yeah. all of us have had and that we will deny to them. Yeah, yeah. This yeah. biggest problem aren't these parliamentarians being elected. And let me tell the members something else. What the European Parliament does is each and every member of the European Parliament is elected. It sits at the heart of the European project. We sit in a parliament where not even half of the parliamentarians who serve here yeah, are elected. It's a disgrace. It really is a disgrace. This will cause us a huge amount of damage just because they want to avoid the democracy and scrutiny that comes with a European Parliament election. But, Mr Speaker, I'm not that surprised when we have a Prime Minister who, as we heard today, opposes a referendum, opposes giving people a say in this momentous decision, and is even opposed to respecting the will of Parliament, as we are being told. Now, if the Brexit debate has done anything, it has shown that the UK and the way in which it operates is no longer fit for purpose, as the House of Lords amply <coughs> illustrates. Yeah, yeah. The EU is not perfect. No union involving 28 sovereign and independent member states ever can be. However, critically, it has the checks and balances to protect the smallest members from the largest. Now, within the UK, we have a constitutional setup that is somewhat outdated, that is not caught up with the momentous decisions that we are having to make now. But in the EU, you have a modern and up to date relationship between member states, a partnership of equals, a true partnership of equals. And I say this to a government that has failed to respect devolution throughout this process. The EU would not be allowed to do that. It cannot be allowed to do that. And to the people of Scotland, our message is this. 
there is a better way of doing this, yeah, yeah, yeah. and a better way that our, that our friends and neighbours, our nearest neighbours in places like Ireland and Denmark, are pursuing successfully. Here, here. This is not as good as it gets. Here, here. <laughs> but in the meantime, and until that point, it's up to each and every one of us to continue to work as constructively as we can. Now, I don't want to see our friends and neighbours from south of the border being dragged over a cliff edge by an out of touch and irresponsible group of Tories anti EU ultras. No country deserves that. Now, the easiest thing for any of us in Scotland would be to say we voted against this. It's not our problem. But actually, it is our problem. Yeah, yeah. And it remains our problem at the moment. <laughs> and we can't just say, well, the Tories made this mess, it's for them to clear up because it is clear they are incapable of clearing up here, the mess here, that they have made. Here, here. The damage that these plans would do to everyone across these islands would be devastating for us all and felt for decades to come. I will thank the members again and those who have worked constructively. Today's motion provides a start, but it is only that, a start and undoing this devastating Brexit that has been brought to us by a Tory party that's out of control. Thank you. Sir Nicholas Sames. Mr Speaker, I will not long delay the House. And can I congratulate the Honourable Gentleman on some very interesting points that he made, many of which I find myself in agreement with. And may I congratulate my right honourable friend, the member for West Dorset, for his absolutely formidable speech, which renders anything that I can say in support of it pretty nugatory. I will, Mr Speaker, be voting for Amendment A tonight. But I want to, if I may, make some general points in this debate. I believe, Mr Speaker, that it is of the greatest importance for our country that we should now move to a conclusion on what is merely the beginning of a tortuous road that will eventually lead to our departure from the European Union. I voted, like my right honourable friend, to trigger Article 50 despite serious reservations on the timing, and I have voted with the Government in every single division on the Withdrawal Act and every other piece of legislation to advance the delivery of Brexit. I have voted to leave and honour the referendum many more times than my honourable friends and member for Uxbridge, South Ryslip, yeah. North East Somerset, Rayleigh and Wickford, Wickham and many others. And I find it ironic that those who apparently wish most fervently to leave are those who have most consistently voted against the withdrawal agreement and thus inhibited any real progress. Yeah. I should make it clear, Mr Speaker, that there are no circumstances that I will vote for a no deal, nor will I back what would be a deeply divisive second referendum. Both are a recipe for further chaos and division, which should be unacceptable to all sides of this argument, for whom surely it is time for logic and common sense to prevail. Like my right hon. Friend, the Member for Penrith and the Border, I still believe in sanity. This is a country with a profound tradition of moderation and common sense. Our democratic institutions are elastic enough to be capable of compromise and of moving from the rhetoric of rejection and to the painful necessity of an actual deal. And it grieves me very much to see our influence abroad, as the Honourable Gentleman for North East Fife said, to see our influence abroad being so degraded as allies and partners who are close friends watch from afar with dismay as we burn up our reservoirs of goodwill and our reputation for common sense, most especially in the European Union. Indeed, although it does not feel like it at the moment, this ancient country in which we are so very privileged to live is in general marked apart from many others by the tolerance, good nature and generally civilised manner of its democracy and institutions. These are qualities that are envied the world over. They need careful nurturing and are currently entirely absent from the field. What on earth has happened to our pragmatism, our self-restraint and our common sense? And it grieves me that our reputation is now under such extreme pressure both at home and abroad. Indeed, our reputation has been gravely diminished. And I greatly regret having to speak in this way in our Parliament. Indeed, I cannot believe that I should need to do so. But like many others, I find myself truly distraught at the painful, difficult and intractable position in which our country finds itself. And what I really want to see 
as I am sure do most members of this House, is that the Government should be able to get on with the work of creating a more confident and hope-filled country that really cares for the weakest amongst us and for those who find their lives to be complicated and difficult, and that encourages opportunity, enterprise and life chances, and most especially keeps its vision of global service and influence as a long-standing force for humanity and the general good. All of us, Mr Speaker, I, I won't if I may, because many others want to speak, please forgive me. All of us know that many of our constituents are understandably extremely angry that Brexit has so distracted the Government from the very serious issues that we face. The NHS, education, crime, the reform of social care, housing, the environment, climate change and all the other great issues that have inevitably had to be neglected as Brexit has gradually sucked the lifeblood out of the Government. The public believe, Mr Speaker, as you very well know, that we have collectively let them down badly. And this is leading inevitably, and in my view very seriously, to the fraying of the bonds between Parliament and the nation. So, Mr Speaker, in my judgment, the national interest clearly dictates that we have got to get this done and that we must now get on with the vital work of establishing our future relationships with our most important economic partners and allies. Mr Speaker, at the beginning of the business of the House every day, the Speaker's chaplain reads the prayer that enjoins us most especially to never lead the nation wrongly through love of power, desire to please or unworthy ideals, but laying aside all private interests and prejudices to keep in mind their responsibility to seek to improve the condition of all mankind. Mr Speaker, all of us need to pay a little more attention to those wise and profound and humane words which have guided and suckered this House through thick and thin down the years and in worse days than now. It is now time that Parliament did its duty by the country for the national interest and for national unity, and regardless of party or inclination, to bring these matters to a belated conclusion. Yeah. Yeah. Margaret Beckett. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is, as ever, a great pleasure to follow the honourable member for right honourable member for Mid Sussex, except that I think I perhaps, should perhaps place on record on the one issue on which I totally disagree with what he said, and also his member for the right honourable friend for West Dorset, which is that I feel that the only way that we will resolve this situation peacefully and in a way that can bring people together is indeed to go back to the people for confirmation yeah, 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 yeah. of whatever decision this House decides to make. Otherwise, I fear we will be seen literally as people who are engaged in an establishment stitch-up to think of something that we then foist on them. Absolutely. I believe it is essential mm -hmm. to seek their view. But I am very conscious, sir, that today's is a crowded agenda, and I believe that the amendment standing in my name and that of others across the House is so straightforward that it practically speaks for itself, so it is my intention to be very brief. I am also mindful of how many others want to speak. I recognise, of course, that the House has voted on more than one previous occasion against the UK leaving the EU without a deal, and the Prime Minister indeed has acknowledged that. I am also well aware that there are, nevertheless, members who feel that whatever the evidence to the contrary, leaving with no deal would not cause us major problems, and that there are even some who actively support our leaving without a deal, or at least regard it as a desirable outcome. But surely there are few, if any, who believe it would be desirable that the UK should not make such a decision, but drift into it, or fall into it, by inadvertence, perhaps almost by accident. That would be the very definition of irresponsibility. And we still have a very tight timetable, which in addition, at present, now encompasses a potential recess period. So my amendment, as I say, is extremely simple, extremely straightforward. It seeks to ensure that the UK can only leave the EU without a deal with the explicit consent of the House of Commons. Yes. 
Yvette Cooper. I write on book and um, it makes a very important speech about the, the risks of no deal. It, would she agree with me that given that the Prime Minister herself said today, unless the House agrees to it, no deal will not happen, However, she has not provided for any process to ensure that there are those safeguards in place and that, therefore, we need the amendment that she has put forward. Otherwise, there is a danger that we could just drift by accident into the kind of chaotic, damaging no deal that both the CBI and the TUC have warned against. Yeah. Yeah. My honourable friend makes a very powerful point in the line with the many contributions she has made on this issue, and I am coming to that in a moment. So um, the amendment guards against a no-deal withdrawal that lacks the clear and evident consent of the House. It also allows for the possibility of the House being in recess when such a danger arose and provides for the seeking of any necessary extension of the leaving deadline. And I was, as my uh, right honourable friend for Pontefract said a moment ago, originally very much encouraged by the Prime Minister's statement uh, made today uh, that, as she says, and I quote, unless this House agrees to it, no deal will not happen, close quotes. That is what this amendment says. So my hope had been that the government might be prepared simply to accept it. It would seem to be the logical thing to do. I am giving the vehicle uh, by which they can give effect to the statement that the Prime Minister made today. And I listened with care to the Chancellor of the Duchy. And I think what he said uh, was that despite the government isn't taking, the fact that the government is not taking any steps, as my right honourable friend for Pontefract just pointed out, to prevent us simply running out of time, um, that that was not necessary. He said the problem with my proposal was that there would then be only two in, uh, options left before the House and that the legal default would be that we leave without a deal. That's the point, Mr Speaker. Um, that's why I tabled the amendment, because I know, um, uh, although I appreciated the Chancellor's explanation, I know that otherwise we would leave by legal default without a deal. And he said, indeed, that uh, the government accepts, he agreed, the government will need to come back to the dispatch, dispatch box to deal with these issues. So I do suggest to the minister on the front bench to pass on to his right honourable friend that really the very simple thing to do, which need, need, need take really no time at all, is simply to accept this amendment and to ensure that the House does not run that indefensible risk of stumbling out of the EU without a deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mr Dominic Grieve. Th thank you, Mr Speaker, and it's a pleasure to participate in this debate and to follow the Right Honourable Lady, uh, the Member for Derby South, and I can tell her now that I shall be voting for her uh, amendment uh, if it is put to the vote, as I hope it will be, at the end of the evening. I shall return to that in a moment. And Mr Speaker, I'm the second signatory on uh, Amendment A, and I just wanted briefly uh, to outline my thoughts as to its necessity uh, and why I think it may help the House. I have obviously approached this in a slightly different way from that of my right honourable uh, friend, the member for West Dorset. Uh, as the House will be perfectly well aware, uh, I, I continue to believe that Brexit is a historic mistake of very great proportions, and I am afraid at no time since the uh, referendum uh, took place have I ever felt, despite efforts on my part to do so, uh, that uh, we are moving towards a position where I could ever take the view uh, that the future outside of the EU was going to be better than remaining in it. But I certainly voted to trigger Article 50 because I did it in deference to the result of the referendum and in the full knowledge that we couldn't even start negotiations unless we did so. And uh, although I have occasionally been characterised as trying to obstruct Brexit, uh, the truth is that throughout the period of, of uh, 2017 and 18, most of the work I did was to try to improve the process because of the concerns that I had that the process was being shortcut, thereby making the likelihood of, of mistaken outcomes uh, all the more likely. 
Um, I think there was only two occasions when I actually put down, so I voted on substantive motions about alternatives, but that was because I was rather worried about the extent to which the government seemed to be self-imposing red lines, uh, and on neither occasion did it come anywhere close to success, and I accepted that, and accepted also that I should reserve my position on what the government was negotiating, and, and indicated that on a number of occasions in debates. Where I disagree or differ from my right honourable friend, the member for West Dorset, is that when I finally came to look at the government's deal as negotiated in December, I have to say that I thought it was a deal that is going to condemn us to a third-rate future. And I'm afraid that's the basis on which I have been unwilling to support it. In saying that, I'm entirely mindful of the fact that it's been negotiated in good faith by my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, and I believe that every member of the front bench has exercised as much diligence as possible to get the best possible outcome. And of course, that then does raise another question. If the outcome secured in December uh, is so unsatisfactory that it is defeated by 220 votes in this House, and defeated in a way because the examination of it from differing directions by honourable members on all sides of the House find it wanting. That does, to my mind, call into question whether in fact a fundamental error has been made and that the entire process has inherent flaws in it. And the difficulty that then arises is that one of the tendencies that has crept in throughout the whole of this debate, ever since the referendum result came out, has been a tendency to close down debate on the basis that it is not proper to pursue it because the referendum result must act as a diktat which prevents such debate taking place. Now, Mr Speaker, I've been long enough in this House uh, to have experienced this sort of argument before, sometimes when governments may get very large majorities in general elections. I even remember on one occasion a member of this House arguing that because the then Labour government had such a big majority, there was no real need anymore to have the second reading debate of bills because the matter should be just put through on the nod, seriously, and that therefore we should just move on to the detail. <laughs> And the one thing I am absolutely persuaded about is that you cannot have a working democracy where you close down debates. Democracy is all about the permanent shifting of tectonic plates. It goes on every day, every second, all the time. Just because somebody is defeated on one matter does not mean that they then have to give up they can keep going at it, and heaven knows we've watched in this House members do just that. And so in the same way, to argue that the referendum result imposes a permanency which cannot be challenged is, in my judgment, entirely wrong. And when I look at the mess into which we've got ourselves, it does appear to me to be at least in part the consequence of pushing this argument and thereby preventing democratic process working. So when, in just a minute, so when we get the criticism that this House is not functioning properly or that democracy isn't working, I actually think this House has an exceptional capacity to reach sensible outcomes I have to say to my honourable friends and right honourable friends on the front bench, it has been consistently and is being prevented from doing its ordinary job by the straitjacket that has been imposed on the extent of what is acceptable to debate. And I give way uh, to the honourable gentleman, no, learned friend, for, for giving way. And would he agree with me, just as um, our um, uh, activities in this place are as such a crucial part of democracy, so are marches that go to the heart of our democracy on the street with a million people, or indeed five and a half million people signing a petition. They're all part of our democracy and they should all be treated with respect. Indeed, particularly when anybody who participated, as I did in Saturday's march, will have seen people who were optimistic, tolerant, 
and filled with good humour and benevolence, even towards those with whom they disagreed. It was very, very noticeable. And if I may say, I contrast that with some of the rabidity of the comments, of which I have been on the receiving end, from those who write to me and insist that by some extraordinary way the referendum has closed down areas of debate and made them illegitimate. And I do think this is something which my honourable friends on the front bench really need to ponder when they consider why things aren't working properly for us at present. Now, it's for that reason, Mr Speaker, and I don't want to take up the House's time, that I've supported uh, the efforts of my right honourable friend, the member for West Dorset, and worked with him and others on Amendment A. Because seeing that the government has run into the sand and had its deal rejected, we have got to find some alternative. Now, I recognise that my right honourable friend, the member for West Dorset, and myself may differ in part on that alternative, but where we don't differ is in our willingness to have an open debate. And I was greatly helped by the way he approached, in his characteristic and tolerant fashion, the examination of alternatives, just as I was in listening to the uh, uh, spokesman for the opposition in terms of the breadth of the approach that might be adopted. It's quite clear that if we're going to make progress, there should be nothing that is forbidden to be discussed. And it's equally clear that we have got to create an environment in which individuals, the members of this House, do not feel that by supporting one option, it means that they're thereby closing the opportunity of expressing a view on another. And I will say no more about process at the moment, except to point out that I think it's most unlikely that on Wednesday, if this motion is passed, we're going to come to a conclusion. It is part of a process. It certainly mustn't be dragged out because we're so short of time. But equally, we've got to take it at a sensible pace. And seeing that we've taken two and a half years to get ourselves into a complete dead end, it's worth taking a few weeks to ensure that we can get ourselves out of it. And that's what we ought to do. And I am the first to accept that it may be that the outcome isn't my preferred one, which remains that whichever option we take, I happen to believe that the evidence is now very clear that the public would like a final say and an opportunity to express a completely alternative view, which might even be remaining in the EU. And I think it is their right and that we should be aiming to achieve that. But whatever the outcome may be, this, for the first time, offers an opportunity to do it. And if I may say, I do entirely disagree, I'm afraid, with my uh, right honourable and honourable friends on the front bench, that this is some desperate constitutional novelty. It is the House doing its job, and I'm afraid the government has only itself to blame by its intransigence over many months of signals being given for up right across the House if on this occasion it has uh, lost uh, the leadership of it to the House itself, it could have had that leadership. And if I may on just finish with this request, my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, is indeed the leader, the leading minister in this country. She is in post. Would she please provide that leadership? If she does, I believe she will find, and she participates fully in this process, and is prepared to open her mind to the variety of options uh, that we are going to discuss and debate, and closes her mind to none of them, that she will find the solution to this problem, and she will find that the House is able to support her. But that needs a change in mindset both by her, I have to say, but also I think by some of my right honourable friend and honourable friends uh, uh, on this side of the House, about getting out of this narrow focus. I said earlier that I found it disgraceful if it is true that the Cabinet minutes reflect putting party political advantage ahead of the national interest. I don't know whether it's true or not, but it's been very widely reported. We have to put the national interest first and listen to what people are saying to us. It seems to me there is a very consistent pattern of wanting to bring this unhappy episode to a conclusion, 
and to want to do it in a way that reflects majority opinion in this country. And we can do that by identifying the options and then putting it back to the public. Thank you uh, very much indeed, Mr Speaker. It is a great pleasure to follow the right honourable and learned gentleman for Beaconsfield. Um, drawing on the speech of the right honourable gentleman for Mid-Sussex, he reminded us of the prayers that start each day. And I don't know whether the right honourable and learned gentleman set out with a desire to please, but I think his speech certainly did please uh, many of us here in the House. I rise to support Amendments A and F uh, moved in what I thought were both really compelling speeches by my right honourable friend, the member for Derby South, and in this context, my right honourable friend, the member for West Dorset. Um, we need to remember, however, that we are here today having this opportunity to debate these two amendments for two reasons and two reasons only. The first is that the government's deal was defeated for a second time. We are discussing a motion in neutral terms today, and we wouldn't have had that chance had it not been for the effort of the Right Honourable and Learned Gentleman and many other people last summer. And secondly, because the European Union decided to give us an additional two weeks. Um, but the fundamental problem has not changed, which is the government's inability to get its deal through. Indeed, it is so lacking in confidence about its ability to win a third time that we're not entirely sure whether and when it will bring it back before the House. And what that means is that in 17 days' time, if nothing changes, either we leave with no deal or the Government will have to uh, apply for and be granted by the European Union an extension. So the moment of danger has been delayed briefly, but it has not passed. Now, having said that, I was uh, surprisingly encouraged. I will give way just once. As he describes as the moment of danger, would it therefore be prudent to have in place steps that mean we'd be revoking and not going headlong over the cliff? Because the European Union has given its deal, has given its options, has been rejected twice, we're now facing the battle of no deal, further extension is probably unlikely. We have to get our heads around it. Revokes coming down the line, we've got to decide over it quickly. Well, I, I hear the argument that the uh, Honourable Gentleman makes, but for the reasons I was just about to advance, I do think the Prime Minister made a very, very significant statement today, which has been drawn attention to by many others, when she said, and it bears repeating every time, unless this House agrees to it, no deal will not happen. Now, I take that to be a solemn and binding commitment from the Prime Minister, but the inevitable consequence, and she didn't want to acknowledge it in her statement today, the inevitable consequence of that binding and solemn commitment is that she will, unless she gets her deal through, have to apply for an extension prior to the 12th of April. Now, turning to the uh, Amendment A, to why is it here? Because the Government's deal has been defeated twice because no deal has been defeated twice, because the Prime Minister said twice and more. Uh, we know what Parliament's against, what is Parliament for? And the purpose of Amendment A is extremely simple. It is to give us the chance to show what we might be in favour of. And if the Government was doing its job, then Amendment A would not be necessary. It is because the Government is not doing its job, Mr Speaker, that Amendment A is required. And if I may say so, the uh, Minister for the Cabinet Office, who is a very uh, charming uh, man, his arguments at the beginning against the amendment were frankly hopelessly confused. Because if I may summarise, they're opposed to the amendment, but they want there to be a process. If the amendment is defeated, then they promise there will be their own process, but that appears to consist of a debate later in the week and then something later on, the precise form of which we do not yet know. They seem to want Parliament to agree on something, but they cannot promise to accept any consensus that might emerge out of this process, and they castigate us for not having reached an agreement, but oppose 
the very proposal tonight that is trying to enable us to do precisely that. It is frankly absurd, and if I also may say so in his absence, I don't really think that the Minister for the Cabinet Office's heart was really in the argument tonight, because the Government in effect seems to be saying, well, if it passes, we'll get on with it. So let us break out of the circular argument. I thought my right hon. Friend, the Member for Hoban, Bankers South, expressed it uh, brilliantly, and get on with it. And I simply want to say, I would encourage every member who has a proposition that is realistic to put it forward uh, if the amendment is carried on Wednesday. Uh, the Brexit Select Committee, in its report it published the very day after the first defeat of the Government's plan, set out what the broad options are. This is not about the withdrawal agreement, because the Prime Minister could not have been clearer today in her statement when she said everyone should be absolutely clear that changing the withdrawal agreement is simply not an option. This is about the political declaration. And on the suggestion, because there was an exchange across the Chamber, that the withdrawal agreement alone might somehow be passed this week, not the political declaration, but the withdrawal agreement, there is a fundamental flaw in that suggestion. If that were to happen, and the EU were to respond by saying, ah, you have passed the withdrawal agreement alone this week, OK, we'll give you to the 22nd of May. What would happen if we then asked the EU in the week leading up to the 22nd, can we have a bit more time? The EU would say to us, oh, but no, you can't because you didn't take part in the European elections. So as a way out of this crisis, I'm afraid that proposition of a separate vote on the withdrawal agreement falls at the first hurdle. Um, when we come to Wednesday and our pink slips are distributed, I'm looking forward to voting aye to remaining in a customs union with the European Union. I'm looking forward to voting aye to a Norway plus uh, type arrangement which could embrace Common Market 2.0. I am looking forward to voting aye to a confirmatory referendum. And other members in the House maybe look forward to voting for the things that they would be prepared to consider. And the final point I want to make, Mr Speaker, is the word indicative is really important because this Wednesday it is about indicating a direction of travel that members might be prepared to support. It is not definitive. We may well need to get to that point in the next stage of this process. So it's not the end. It is merely the beginning. It is long overdue, and I hope the House tonight will enable that to happen by carrying Amendment A.